Hello friends, this is Muse Fanfictions, how are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Naruto and Freya the goddess of love and beauty were couples. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Rain poured down heavily from the heavens. Lying on the ground, beaten and bloodied, a young blonde lay in a growing pool of his own blood. His orange outfit was ripped, torn, and shredded to pieces. His right arm was ripped off, sliced by a literal bolt of lightning, at the lower shoulder. There was a cut across his left eye, the socket empty and bloodied from the knife that had torn into the optical nerve and severed it from the body. On his chest, there were two new scars, slowly healing. One was located on the left shoulder, now a jagged scar that would never heal properly and would always remain to remind him of his blunder. The second one was directly over the heart and had both an entry and exit opening to show that the attack had fully pierced his chest cavity, the pool of crimson life growing further from the constant expelling of blood from his slowly beating heart. Then something happens as if a fate had preordained it to become. Walking along the shore of the river was a figure wearing a dark brown cloak. The person seemed to be a man, as he was just passing through but he came to cross the boy laying there. He came up to him and he said, Boy, are you alive? In a deep tone of voice as he placed his free hand on the back of the team. Look at the boy, the man can see that he seems to be around 13, maybe 14 years old, but all the man could hear from the boy is soft groans, showing that he was alive, if only just. Without saying anything else, the man grabs the young man and hoists him up onto his back, not caring for the blood. He had seen and experienced worse. It was nothing new to him. And with that, he walks away. Minutes later, a man wearing a green vest and a mask over his face landed in the valley and saw the pool of blood. He had come too late again. Minato sensei would have been more than disappointed. But, that day he made a vow, Sasuke Uchiha would die by his hand for killing his fellow student by his hand. Meanwhile outside of the land of fire's border, midnight. Sounds of crackling wood from a campfire greeted him as he groggily opened his eyes. The young blonde wakes up, just only for a brief moment, he opens his only eye and sees that he's laying on a makeshift bed, as well as the fire nearby. Then he notices a man in a coat sitting by the fire. He is garbed in a dark cloak that covered his head and body, the exception being the single arm that slowly stirred a pot that sat in the flame, a long red line a tattoo probably running along his arm and into the cloak. Before he can say anything, the man speaks in a deep gravelly voice, you're awake, good, he says, I trust you learned a valuable lesson in that fight. He questions. The boy in a tired yet defeated voice, H how do you even know? There was no one else but me and, a friend, he questions. The man gives a chuckle at the boy's question, that is simple, a warrior would know when a battle is held and ended, but it looks to me as if you were on the losing end. An eye and an arm are not something that can go unnoticed as I'm sure you already figured out. How do you plan on making your next move? The man questioned. I need to get stronger. The boy declared, I have a promise to keep. I'll just go back and talk to the pervy sage and the, he gets cut off, and then what? Kill the one who did this to you. If I have to guess, this person in question is this so-called friend you mentioned earlier. What no? To bring him back, says the young boy. Though his face was covered by the cloak, the boy could tell the man was shaking his head, so foolish. The man states, so tell me this promise of yours, who asked you to make it? He questions, such childish notions weren't made without outside interference, usually of the feminine kind. Well, Sakura asked me, she asked me to bring Sasuke back, says the boy. Hearing this makes the man laugh incredibly hard, to the point he had to hold his gut from lack of air as if he knew this would be the answer and reason, so a girl, asks you, to risk your very life to bring back this other boy, this Sasuke. The man questions as he calms himself down. That's right, I will do anything for her since I, he gets cut off, oh spare me, I know what a love sick fool would do for someone who doesn't have the same feelings. And what you have isn't love, trust me. If a girl is begging you to bring someone back and knows you love her, then she manipulated you. The best thing you can do is forget him, leave her or kill her cause I see no problem ending such people for the greater good. This causes the boy to be angry and snaps at the man, you take that back. 
You don't know what you are talking about. And I would never do such a thing. And stops as he groans as he holds his shoulder. The man ignores this, maybe so, then tell me, what were you trying to do, such trying back this Sasuke back? I it was a mission, given by Grandma Tsunade, to bring back Sasuke or else he would, well now, gone to that snake man. Snake man, the man inquires curiously, he's an old teammate of Grandma Tsunade, his name is Orochimaru. He went rogue a couple of years before I was born and experimented on people so he can find a way to become immortal and learn everything the world over or something like that. He thinks well wholeheartedly believes I should say that Sasuke's bloodline will quicken the process so he can become some type of god or whatever. The boy shrugs. It seems what I said before still stands if that's the case, he was better off killed than be in the hands of your enemy, said the man. Hearing this makes the blonde young man's anger spike up, what do you know? He demands. Calmly, the man looks at him, what would I know? I know what it's like to be enslaved. To be told who or what to kill, not caring who they were. Believing that as was all for some grand design for me to become a great warrior, he shows more of his arm as his skin is white as ashes, with red marking, you see this. He questions, this was the curse placed upon me for my actions. I killed many who were deserving, and many who were not. My own wife and child, my father, brothers, and sisters, and for my actions of killing the innocent, the ash of their bodies is now a burden to carry for the remainder of my days, he tells the boy softly. The boy couldn't say anything, but the man continues to speak, what I am, what I will always be, is a monster, and monsters are better off killed and dead and you just sealed your friend's life that, he stares at the boy, your ideas, these childish beliefs, whatever your people do on their lands, you had led them into their doom, all cause you promised a childish little girl to bring back a boy who clearly didn't want to return. But it seems that you paid for your sins already, theirs will come in due time, make no mistake about that. The boy just stares at the man. So what am I gonna do, where am I gonna go? Sasuke was like a prince to the people of the village, and if I return without him things will be worse for me than they already were. They don't care about any of us that tried to help Sasuke come back, and they sure as hell wouldn't celebrate me dragging him back, they'd try and finish what Sasuke tried to do. I can't fight with one arm and eye, I'm not that skilled, not like my teacher Kakashi Sensei, the boy responded. Follow your own path, ignore the desires and whims of the chain, and break it. Be who you want to be, not what others wish for you to become, the man tells the child. Well, my dream is to be the Hokage, to be someone they respect and admire. That's all I ever wanted, says the boy. The man nods in understanding, to be respected and admired. Um if I know any better, you sound like a man that I once knew from my homelands. You almost sounded like my old friend, Atreus. Was he a soldier? He was a soldier, a Spartan, a great warrior. All Spartans are great warriors. We train from birth. Our lives were duty, discipline, battle, and death. Life was grim, and we greeted it grimly. But Atreus of Sparta was unlike the rest of us. He wore a smile, even in the worst of times. He was, happy. He inspired others to hope, that though we were machines of war, there was humanity in us. Goodness. When the day came for him to lay down his life in battle, his sacrifice saved countless others and changed the tide in our favor. I carried him home on his shield and buried him with the full honors of the Spartan customs. His memory was comfort in dark times. The boy is in awe, he sounds like a great guy. The man nods, that he was. Now boy, what are you going to do? He set his eyes back on the pot. The boy shrugged his shoulder, I guess, I don't know, go with you. This causes the man to stop stirring the food, this is surprising, are you certain? Cause if you do follow me, there's no telling when you are able to return to these lands that are your home and no, I'm not a soft teacher. I know but a person such as you, who doesn't give me bullshit excuses, doesn't show up late. Or let alone go off teaching someone else what he knows down to a full-on assassination technique, please, let me go with you. The boy pleads. Hum. The man hums to himself, what is your name, boy? The man asks. Naruto Uzumaki, what's your name? I am Kratos, of Sparta. The now named Kratos responds before he then looks at the now named Naruto, and we have lots of things to work on. But for now, focus on your recovery, and when you are able, 
We will be leaving their lands and who knows, and know that the journey will be rough, it won't be easy but it will be rewarding in the end. Naruto nods, as he has no clue about the hardship he will face in the coming days. But he will return home, no matter how long it will take. Flash forward to 12 years later. Konoha, middle of the day. It's been 12 years since that day at the Valley of the End. It was well known that the failed mission put the team that had taken it placed in grim danger. The revelation that Sasuke Uchiha didn't just defect to Orochimaru the Snake Sanin and the worst rogue ninja since the time of Madara Uchiha, but the boy who killed his friend all for the sake of getting revenge stirred a lot of mixed feelings in the population. It made them question things, if Sasuke Uchiha was willing to kill his supposed best friend and teammate all for the sake of power, what other atrocities would he pull just to see his goals come to fruition? Now status among the clans, the village, and ninja system, as well change of leadership was under change once again. The name and power behind one of the clans, the Uchiha clan, with now most of the members as well being a founding clan, the Uchiha's wrath, status, and power no longer held any meaning. As far as the village was concerned, the Uchiha clan had disgraced itself beyond measure and was beyond redeeming itself. Sasuke Uchiha was placed into the bingo book as AA rank ninja with a bounty of 50,000 dead only hit on his head. Orochimaru was wanted strictly dead with a 1 billion bounty as he was a SS class ninja. His second in command, Kabuto, was wanted alive or dead with a 150 million bounty on his head due to being S class in rank. All in all, those in charge wanted the Uchiha dead, with no excuses of complaining, begging and whining that could change that. Though, only one person was still trying to change that so her beloved Sasuke could come home with a heavy penalty on him but wasn't getting her way as the letter signed by the Dayamo explicitly explained that the murder of a Konoha ninja in any attempt to gone rogue was treason and was punishable by however the Hokage saw fit. In the village themselves, there have been changes as well such as villagers no longer having a say about the affairs of the ninjas, and any who dared to try to place any harm on a child for something they didn't do that's out of their hands were immediately executed. The civilian council had lost all say in political meetings, and lost 80% of their income which was never used to better the village but their own pockets was sent to the more distressed areas of the village. The elders were strictly demoted to giving advice to the Hokage and the ninja council only and were not allowed to pass any laws. The Hokage even was placed under strict observation and control. Laws that had to be passed went through the daimyo and his advisors for a double check before being signed off to be a law or denied. Clan affairs were untouched with the exception being the caged bird seal. The seal that induced slavery into half the Hyuga clan for generations. Now legally made an illegal act to have the brand placed on any member of the Hyuga clan, was officially banned for enslavement which was already illegal to begin with. Those who tried to continue to old practice were immediately executed to serve as a warning, several people were still on thin ice for trying it again behind closed doors for the second warning was that the entirety of the Hyuga would be exterminated to the last child if it was revealed to be continued when now outlawed by the ruler of Fire Country. Now, to the ninja system itself, it went through a major overhaul, as such, adding teaching of medical justice, and changing certain teams was now a standard for all classes. Elemental affinities were learned and taught the basic control exercises as well as chakra control techniques. Only seasoned Jonin with explicit permission could teach any jutsu with a signed approval from the daimyo being the only way to pass on a jutsu. This was mostly due to Sasuke Uchiha using AA rank, borderline S rank, assassination technique to kill his own teammate for his selfish ambitions. When the revelation that Naruto was the last Uzumaki alive for all intents and purposes Sasuke Uchiha became the number one enemy for all major and minor clans in Konoha when the legacy of the Uzumaki clan was revealed. The Uzumaki had defended their island home for five months against enemy nations from three major countries and sixteen minor before they were overrun and destroyed while it only took a single man to wipe out the Uchiha spoke volumes of how powerful Naruto's family truly was. And not only that, there are changes in the academy as well, they removed the whole basic jutsus for the graduation exam, this was added to weed out those who truly might want to be a ninja and those who think it was just a game. And now, into the Hokage's office, was a woman, with blonde hair, brown eyes, with a blue mark on her forehead. She is a fair-skinned woman with brown eyes and straight blonde hair that parts above her forehead. Her hair has shoulder-length bangs that frame her face and the rest reaches her lower back. Wears a grass green haori with the kanji for, 
Gamble, cake on the back, inside a red circle. Underneath she wears a gray, kimono-style blouse with no sleeves, held closed by a broad, dark bluish-gray obi that matches her pants. Her blouse is closed quite low, revealing her sizable cleavage. She wears open-toed, strappy black sandals with high heels. She has red nail polish on both her fingernails and toenails and uses a soft pink lipstick. As for what she was doing, well that was simple, she is looking through the normal mountain of paperwork, this is Tsunade, a woman with the blood of the Senju and Uzumaki running through her veins. Tsunade sighs as reading about affairs of other villages as well trading routes and such then she hears, Lady Tsunade. Tsunade looks up from the papers and sees her longtime friend and former traveling companion and now assistant. Shizun. Yes Shizun, Tsunade asks as she places the paper down to look at the woman. She's trying again, Shizun commented as she passed her the paper. Taking it, she simply grabbed a red stamp and pressed it once into the red ink before slapping it down on the paper, a large, denied, printed in red across the page yet again. Send her away, and tell her to find a better hobby than trying to annoy me with a murdering psychopath being redeemed. She ordered the woman, and tell her that if she tries again she's going back to T&I for a week. And also inform her, that if I see another referral to try and repeal Sasuke Uchiha's status as a missing ninja again, she's going to prison for obstructing the Hokage's elite forces from carrying out their orders for life. Then inform her that if she continues to bother me with this, after she is sent to prison, her chakra will be permanently sealed off, and she will be sent to level 7. She said before moving back to her original paperwork without so much as another word coming out of her mouth. I would, but she's at the door my lady, says Shizun. Tsunade just groans, by the gods, just how dumb is this girl? She snapped her fingers and a pair of anbu appeared before her, take her away, I don't want to hear it, she commanded. They left to carry out their orders, Shizun says, and to think once upon a time, you wanted to take her as a student. Shizun said, shaking her head. Tsunade sighed, so much potential, wasted. All over a stupid crush turned obsession. She stated, I'm kind of glad I managed to make Ino and Hinata learn some of my skills. I'm more disappointed than anything that Sakura harps over that damned Uchiha brat. And it's been 12 years, going on 13 now. Shizun says, okay how about we take a break and get fresh air, I'm sure it will help you cool off my lady as a pig come up to Tsunade and lets out, oink, yeah that sounds nice, she gets up and both along with the pig named Taunton, they're gone outside. Meanwhile at the gates of Konoha, a lone man wearing a smooth white coat, the hood pulled up enough covering his face and head can be seen as he looks around as he talks to himself, a dozen years away, and nothing has changed. They all think that they are safe here behind these walls, they know nothing, the man muttered to himself. Gripping the small rope holding his travel bag, the man pulls it up and makes his way forward with no clear destination in mind. The man calmly walks up to the guards as he talks, hello there, calmly. The two men note that as he speaks, the guards look at the man as one of them with a strip of bandage running across the bridge of his nose and a light-colored marking on his chin speaks up. Um yes, how can I help you sir? Said the guard, he isn't sure what to make of this guy in the coat, and was that, a head on his hip. Oh yes, say lad could you lift me up, just let me do the talking, says another voice, which freaks out him and the other guard as the coated man grabs the end of a rope that's tied to the head and lifts it up. Oh yes, thank you, now then I'm Mimir and this lad is an old companion of mine. This is Magni, son of Magnus and Magda, he introduces himself and his companion. How are you able to talk, let alone function, you're ahead? The first guard says with wide eyes. How perceptive of you, but it's all right, it's just a flesh wound I assure you. Mimir jokes. Enough Mimir, we are here on business, not to socialize with the locals. Magdi states. Yes yes, always such a rush like your die ain't you. Now then we are just here to visit, you know how these folks do, sightseeing and all, may you let us through. Said the head of Mimir. Kotetsu and Azumo look at each other and shrug, this was first so they had no clue as to what to do. I mean, yea we can, it's just, strange to see a talking head, might want to do something about that so you don't scare people. Azumo points out. I'm quite aware of this, Magdi says, and so full of humor too. Mimir grumbles as Magdi puts him under his cloak, you could use a bath ya you know. The head questions. 
and you could use a body so I don't have to worry about dropping you off to the fish. Magdi responds. I'd like to see you try, that stubborn brother of yours would make you fish me out of the water. Mimir retorts with a laugh. Both make their in as the guards look at each other with one of them saying, so we are not going to report the Anbu about a guy in a coat with a talking head. No way besides, it's likely some genjutsu to play mind tricks with us, as the first one went back to his post as the other responds, if you say so. Moments later, really, said the coat man as he held up the head of Mimir with his left arm as they stood on the rooftop of a building, of all the names, you pick Magdi. Son of Magnus, what did you drink? You know I can't drink much less eat anything, it'll go right through me. Besides, we couldn't risk revealing your true identity now, can we? It was either the made-up stuff, or we simply speak your real name and suffer some consequences we can't get out of. Mimir stated. Right right, I forget, I'm basically a dead man, said the cloaked man, then looking at Mimir as the head asks. Now then on to more important matters, my lad, how does it feel to be back to the place you were born and raised? Must be nostalgic for you, the body less head questioned, raising a brow. I feel nothing, nostalgia is a comfort that I cannot afford at the moment, or did you forget, the son of Odin hunts me, he stated. Oh forgive me for wanting to shed some light on our situation, my boy, after all, for time being you are safe as Esir gods have no power here, given the land around belongs to another pantheon of gods. The cloaked man, and you forget, the gods here don't get involved with the humans here, explained the man. Ah you worry too much. Say here's an idea, why not we go get you a drink then maybe, you will loosen up a bit, gods know it you haven't since we left home. The last drink I had was that weird mead that the blue one gave me, and I never sat right with alcohol since, said the cloaked man. All right, how about we found a nice lass for you and the... Are you sure you are not one of these, cool uncles, I hear about? Asked the cloaked man. Mimir laughs, no I'm afraid my boy. I'm all about the good times, well besides being an all-knowing advisor. And yet you fell off a mountain and had to be saved by a Valkyrie. I'll have you know, that that incident took place 360 winters ago, Mimir grumbled. Right, anyway I'm not going to look for a woman, but rather, food as I'm hungry, he looks in a certain direction, I wonder if they're still open. He asks himself before he jumps off and rejoins the crowd of villagers. The cloaked figure is walking while hearing Mimir saying, Ah, oh, this is a nice village lad, I can see why many would want to try and attack here, it has lots of trees, a nice sizable mountain with faces, clear skies, and fresh air. What more could a pantheon ask for? As he looked around. HMPH, nothing, but the fools are always taking what doesn't belong to them. Why Hashirama deigned to walk among mortals and preach about peace is a mystery. All they ever do is fight and complain about what they don't have and always kill those who wrong them, the man disguised as Magi responded. Well, that's human nature lad, they'll always have the innate desire of wanting more and will do anything to get it, even if it means fighting for it. Be it wealth, food, land, hell women, have been like that since before time itself was even considered a concept, says Mimir's children who notice the talking head that's being hung onto the side of Magi, and Magi says, I guess so. As one of the children says to their mother, Mommy, that head is talking. The mother who was busy talking was saying, Yes we all do dear, she was not looking at what her child was pointing to. She was conversing with a vendor about a small purchase and only spoke to placate her child. It wasn't out of rudeness, she was just busy trying to get some stuff to feed her children. I think it would be best if you stop for the time being. Too many eyes around, Magdi stated. Oh, I see. Yes, I can understand why. Mimir said, I'll be quiet now. Well quit attempting to be quiet and just close your lips. Will you pull the stick out your rear and be yourself and not your dog? It's not right to me, Mimir muttered. The head is now thinking about it, where are they heading to? Soon enough. There it is. Said Maggie as they're a few steps away from a stand, with its sign saying, Ramen Ichiraku, and for a bodiless head, the scent is amazing, by Odin's beard, this smell. Oh it's making my mouth watery, lad where did you take us to? A place that holds some of my most precious memories, says Magdi softly as he grabs Mimir and puts him on the counter, here, have a look, he tells him. Ah, a nice and homey atmosphere, I like it. It's been a long time since we saw something like this. 
Mimir admitted. It was then a young woman came from the back and waved at them. Hello. Welcome to Ichiraku Ramen. My name is Ayame. Can I get you something? She asked happily. I want twelve of your miso ramen, five bowls of red bean paste, and the best sake you have under the counter, Magdi said, placing some gold coins on the counter. Seeing that the gold coins are quite big and thicker than any form of currency she has seen before, Ayame felt her eyes widen by this as she said, I I don't think we have enough change for this sir. I do not want change in return. This is for the entire purchase and a bit of investment on my part. Take it as a sign of gratitude on my behalf. Magdi told her. The young woman stutters in shock. T thank you, I will get your order then your drink sir. She takes the coins and informs the chef who is also her father and within a few seconds a shout comes from the back, he paid with this. The male voice exclaims from the back as Mimir chuckles, Ayame gets the strongest sake we have. This makes Magdi laugh in his thoughts. Old man Tuki, this money will help you to expand your business far beyond this forsaken village and allow you to spread your love of cooking to reaches you could only dream of. I hope that this small amount will help you on your journey. A couple of seconds later, Ayame returns with a bottle of sake in hand and places it on the counter. Why your order will be ready in a little bit sir. Thank you for your generosity, she said, giving the bottle to Magdi. Thank you, he says, taking the bottle and opening it before proceeding to guzzle the wine at an incredible pace before he sets the empty bottle down. It's been a long time since I had a good wine from home, he says politely. Ayame says, oh you're from here. I don't think I met someone like you before, given your clothes, she says while looking at the style of clothes Magi is wearing. Nodding, Magi says. Yes, it's just been a few years since I was here, he informs her. Ayame says, I see, well welcome back and I hope you enjoy your meal. She smiles before turning to leave. What a nice lass, said Mimir with Ayame's eyes turning white as a dish and white as she slowly turns to the head that's on the counter, she just thought it was one of their fake ones see in shopping stores. Mimir, you need to learn when to be silent. Magdi sighs out, forgive me. I had told him to be silent to not scare others. But, as you can see, he doesn't listen all that well. Magdi says, Miss Ayame, meet Mimir, a traveling companion of mine, he told her. H he's an H head, T that talk, says Ayame. I, that I am lass, why? Mimir asks. H how? Ayame asks as she knows the life of a ninja is full of surprises but this is just too much for her. Mimir laughs. Would you believe me if I said, magic? He asks with humor. Mimir, enough, Magdi said harshly. Oh fair enough and I don't think she could handle any more I'm about to say anyway, said Mimir moving his eyes to the young woman who looks shocked, and any more, she might break. And this is why you should speak when it's just us, said Magi. I know, but I was curious, can't blame now can ya? Mimir says. Order up. Chuki calls from the back where Ayame rushes to get the food for the paying customer. It was just that moment someone else walked in. It is a woman, with sandy blonde hair, with teal colored eyes, wearing clothes from another village, which is a battle style kimono as well carrying a large fan on her back, she has a nice figure with large breasts of double G's, wide child birthing hips. This is Tamari, a kunoichi from the Suna. From what he remembers of her looks he can see that she's changed drastically. Temeri's hair has changed again, now it has only two ponytails at the bottom of the back of her head. She wears a pair of simple white earrings, a light pink lipstick, and also a shuriken holster on her right thigh. Temeri's outfit consists of a dark blue short-sleeved dress that reached her above her knees, a beige belt with white polka dots around her belly, which also serves to carry her fan, fingerless black gloves, and high-heeled boot sandals with wooden soles. She shouts. Hey can I have a bowl of shrimp and a plate of yakisoba? She calls into the back. Then she notices the cloak and near him is a head with glowing eyes. She hummed as she thought, a foreigner. Look at the cloak and pants, he's not around from here or anywhere in the other lands. She takes her seat but away from Magi and Mimir as Magi whispers, don't say a word Mimir. Ayame brings out Magdi's numerous bowls of food and places them down in front of him and he thanks her before he begins to dine silently by using his left arm. She had gotten a glimpse of the right one, and she noticed it was a deep ebony black metal with golden symbols, runes of his homeland she supposed. A prosthetic, how rare. 
she hardly met a person with a lost limb with a fake one and was able to function with it. Tamari wanted to ask him about it but realized it's for the best that she doesn't, or else she might wake up some unfavorable memory. However, Magdi is more perceptive than she thought, if you are curious, I would not mind answering. And for your information, I lost it in a fight against someone I called brother. I still have to pay him back for what he took from me. Not just my arm, but an eye as well, he commented. As a single glow is seen through the darkness of the hood as well revealing the arm. And he could move it, which surprised both women in the restaurant. As Tamari says, wait, you can move it. Or are you tricking me to have me think it's some prosthetic but in truth, it is just covered in armor. Magdi laughs as he has his left hand and removes the hand part, what do you think? He asks as he makes the hand clench after placing it on the counter. How do you make it do that, advanced sealing techniques? Tamari asks while moving closer as she is very curious. Magdi laughs, seals, please, the place I lived didn't have such things. Where I am from there are runes, and they hold great power plus I know a pair of brothers, annoying as they are, they are experts in their craft, he tells her before replacing the limb. Must be some pair of brothers, to make a fully functioning prosthetic like that it's nothing short of amazing, said Tamari as Ayame had gone off to leave the two to their talk. Magdi chuckles, only when they get along, he says as he starts eating his first bowl. The blonde woman looks at the cloaked figure curiously, they don't get along. She asked, she knows that brothers, well siblings, in general, do that. In a way, yes, said Magi. I'm sure they'll make up. Said Tamari and upon hearing that, Magi couldn't hold it in and laughed as he thought, yay right. Brock and Cindir, making up, it'll be a cold day in hell before that happens. Hell, that will be the day Fimblewinter begins. So stranger, what's your name? Tamari asks, as she wants to get to know this mysterious man more. Magdi snorts as he swallows his food, me, I'm Magi, son of Magnus and Magda. Tamari blinks at his name, Magdi huh, that's an odd name, I guess I was right, you're not from around here, huh? She questions. Magdi shakes his head, it wasn't my original name, my folks just decided to change it after we moved away from here, what it was, I don't remember it. It's been so long since I spoke it, even heard it, he slurps the noodles. Tamari then has her eyes on the head that's near Magdi and points, so what's with the head? Do you just carry it around or so methy? She stops when Mimir laughs, oh I like this one. Much better than that other lass who nearly punted me into the lake of the nine for that joke I made about the carpet and drapes. He laughs. Goo, what the hell? Tamari exclaimed in shock, it's alive. She cried out. Well, partially, I mean, I did have him cut my head off and reanimate me so we could travel. I swear, that tree left me with the worst of itches that I could never reach. Especially one in the rear bits of my, he went to rant only for Magdi to clear his throat, ah, right, sorry. Mimir says, sounding embarrassed, anyways dear, allow me to introduce myself. Mimir says, clearing his throat, I'm the greatest ambassador to the gods, the giants, and all the creatures of the nine realms. I know every corner of these lands, every language is spoken, every war waged, every deal ever struck. They call me, Mimir, smartest man alive, and I have the answer to your every question, the head said grinning. You've been waiting to use that one for a while again, haven't you? Magdi asks Mimir. Of course, any chance I can get to introduce myself like that is a good thing. Mimir states. Tamari calms herself and laughs, well, you certainly give a better introduction than that perverted toad sage ever did back in the day. Shame, he would have loved to meet you, she said. This toad sage, whatever happened to him? Mimir asked curiously. His peeping got him in trouble with a few women, he's recovering in the hospital at the moment. Happened about three months ago now that I think about it. Tamari hung. Well, I most certainly wouldn't blame the maidens for putting him there. Mimir converses. Miss Ayame, some more of your best sake, if you'd please. Magdi says putting more gold coins on the counter, and can you bring two bottles this time? He asks her as he pushes the coins forward. Ayame does so. I need a drink anyway since well, today is a bit of a tough one, says Tamari with a deep sigh. Hearing this, Mimir says, how so lass? He has a feeling what she meant. Well, today is the day when I and my team helped out to try and ah, 
help some friends. They were put together for a retrieval mission and well, let's say, it didn't work out quite as well as we had hoped. We failed, and our, target I guess you can say, escaped us. But, not without cost. Our quarry ended up killing one of the members of the team, a young man by the name of Naruto Uzumaki. She explained, he was the best friend of the man we were trying to bring back, you see, and all that we managed to find of Naruto was a pool of his blood. His demon never revived itself even after a couple of years like most tailed beasts, giant monsters of energy that can cause incredible levels of damage if they wanted. Many assume that Naruto dragged the beast with him to his grave. Or maybe the beast just didn't want to come back, hard to say. She finished softly. Well, were you close with this Naruto lad, young lass? Mimir asks her. Tamari shakes her head, no, not, to be honest, he was some loudmouth brat I met during an exam, but that same loudmouth was the one who saved my little brother and brought back his humanity, Tamari answered, with a small smile on her, it's such a shame, if that kid was able to save Gara, I wonder what he could have done if he was still around, she says in curiosity. As Tamari does this distant glare while thinking of that day, Mimir turns his eyes to look at Maggie shortly then back to Tamari, I see, I might be a bit behind on certain things given I was bonded to a tree and all, but I'm curious now. Whatever happened to the other team members? Tamari snaps out of it, we all survived, and it was thanks to Naruto giving his life for us. She answered, Sasuke Uchiha has killed dozens of his former comrades from the leaf who have come after him. A large portion of them are some of the most elite warriors we have, but they can never match him in battle. His signature attack is a bolt of lightning to the victim's heart. This was the same attack he used to kill Naruto from what we can guess. After he kills his enemies, he sends their heads back into a box. He's strong, but he will fall eventually, she said, determined. More so since his older brother is here and in the hospital. This is when Maggie chokes on his food and starts coughing, Tamari says, hey are you okay? She asks in a bit of worry, her drinking buddy, new or not, was entertaining. Yes, I am fine. Maggie says once he clears his throat. You made me worried for a second there. Wouldn't want my new drinking partner to have a heart attack now would we? She laughs. No no, just something went in the wrong pipe, he lied as in his thought, Itachi is here. But why, why would the guy who caused all of this be here in Konoha? And in a hospital no less. Mimir moved his eyes to the sides as he said, are you alright, brother? Brother, oh, right now I remember. Itachi Uchiha, the man who single-handedly nearly wiped out his clan, why would a man with his skills at that caliber be in the hospital? He questions. Tamari looks at the head, wow, you are behind on things. While patting Maggie's back, he's their cause he's sick, very sick, terminal almost if not already. Tamari told him. I may be behind on some things, lass, but never doubt old Mimir on his knowledge. Mimir told her, the last time that happened, I still had the ability to itch my butt. Oh when was that, I think it was 200 winters ago. Mimir thinks back. Before she could say anything else, they hear a group of four drunks walk in on one of them, hey ramen people. I want a bowl, as he slams his hand on the counter with another a bottle, as Ayame says, um sir, I have to ask for you and your friends to leave. The guy looks at Ayame, and says, huh, why? I just want a bowl of ramen. Is that wrong? Ayame says. W well you are disrupting the other customers and we don't take too kindly to those who are heavily under the influence. She is nervously sweating, she hates dealing with this. So what if I'm a little drunk? I just want a bowl and so do my friends. However, before anything could escalate, Maggie spoke in a deep tone that made the group shiver, watch. Your. Tone. Boy. He growled out as he gazed at the man. You will not dishonor this woman's wish and you and your allies will vacate this shop immediately, or I will make you, he growled. Calm yourself brother, remember the last time you got angry. The sons of Thor lost their lives to you, and you killed the heir to the throne soon after. Mimir warned. Please, do you think I'm scared of some foreigners? And a goat head speaking some nonsense. Do you think you know me? My pals and I are Junins. We will do what we like, said the drunk guy. With Tamari looking at them then remembers, wait I remember hearing a group of girls talking about having broken up with their now ex. Don't tell me. I do not care about rank nor status. 
You will do as she demands. She asked you to either calm yourself or to leave the premises. Listen, pal, you're garbed in a cloak and have a goat-faced head, you're no match for us, another man called out. Magdi snorts, you say that, but I have fallen men stronger than any of your best on my worst of days. Magdi states, listen, friends, I would listen to him. He's killed men that could wipe out armies on their own with only a single arm, he's not one you want to piss off. Mimir pleads. Then, splash, shut it goat face, said the guy as the others laughed and Mimir spits out the stuff that got on him and says, you know what? Forget what I say, go right ahead brother, and may the prayer of the gods have mercy on their souls. There are no gods here for them, Magdi says before he grabs the first man with his right arm and smashes his head into the counter before throwing him out, a splash of blood follows him. Magdi is punched across the face, but doesn't even budge as the man who hit him turned pale, was that supposed to do something? Magdi questioned before he kicked the man in the stomach and out of the shop. The other two with one of them shout at Magdi in rage, you fucker. As he and the other bring out their kanais, and Magi jokingly says, no. Not kanais, my one true weakness, before he grabs the two men by the throat and then smashes their head together, as if, he adds before throwing them out of the shop, and stay out if you know what is good for you. Magdi says, not realizing his hood had fallen. Before he could turn around, brother, your hood, said Mimir in a warning. Magdi grunts as he pulls the garment up before he turns and sits back down, so besides him kicking ass, does he have a problem showing his face to us? Tamari asks as she was unable to see any of Magi's face. Ayame, however, has heart appearing around her as she says to herself, my hero. Sitting back down, Magdi pulls the hood tighter and places more gold down onto the counter, for your troubles, he tells her. Continuing his meal, Magdi grabs the bottle of sake and drinks some before taking a platter of the red bean paste and scooping some into his mouth, this is good, thank you. He says putting the final plate down before standing up, come on Mimir, we have a business to attend, he says as he grabbed the head and placed it on his hip. It was nice conversing with both of you, I should hope to see each of you later on, yeah. He asks. Mimir, you know that you are unable to walk, leave them be. Magdi states. Oh can't a head be a charmer? Said Mimir with Magdi laughing as Tamari says. Well, see you guys soon, with that both walk out. Within a few moments later, Tamari starts fanning herself as she says. Hot damn that guy is ripped. She is blushing. Outside the drunks are laying on the road and groaning in pain. As one of them says, I think my nose is broken. Sometime later, at the Hokage Mountain, Magdi finds himself on top of one of the Hokages as holds up Mimir and says, so it seems there's an event of things I had no idea was happening while I was away Mimir. Well brother, times and people change, and as your da would say, you can't hope to change that. Even with his blood now coursing through your veins, you can't help but want to protect these people, can you now? Mimir asks. He did it to save my life all those years ago when he found me, and I will never be able to pay him back for it. Atreus will need to grow before he can venture out more, and mother will have wanted me to come back and sort out my past, he said to the head. Well, that axe and those blades will certainly help out in the long run, Mimir said in agreement. After a bit of no talking, Mimir says, so that Tamari girl, she's quite a looker, she will make a nice wife for you, your da would most certainly approve of her wits, manner, and charm. Snorting, Magi says, that is not happening and besides if I remember right, she and an old friend of mine had an unspoken thing for each other, as he remembers a certain guy with a hairstyle that scrutinizes like pineapple as well being very lazy. Well, if I know you, and in which case I do, you never chase skirts that have already been taken, yeah. It is an honorable thing to do, Magdi states, oh don't lie to me, everyone knows about you and, Mimir starts only for Magdi to interrupt him, we are not talking about that. He growls. Apologies brother. I forgot it was a sensitive subject. Mimir sighed, so, what now? Freya is inbound to help you on your quest. Meanwhile, your da and brother are back home, and Baldur is hunting you for killing his kin, Thor, Magni, Modi, and a couple of others. You need to find a way to conceal yourself from them and the other gods that search for you and your prisoner. Mimir stated. I have time, just have to tie up some loose ends before we carry on from here, said Magi. Mimir snorts at him 
Oh yeah, and what's the first one on the list? Mimir asks. Simple. Talk to old friends, old acquaintances, and sigh, an old, crush, if I could even say that, said Maji as he takes off his hood with Mimir sighing softly to himself. The girl you told me about, this soccer a girl. Nice name but rotten personally though from what you have told me of her. I can never understand what it is you ever saw in her, I mean for Asgard's sake, she was abusive and crude to ya growing up. And I highly doubt she changed in the time you were away in the northern lands. Mimir stated. I will give her the benefit of the doubt. But if she has not changed, she is dead to me then. I learned the hard way that lust and love are two very different things. I will not succumb to childish emotions like I would when I was a child. Magdi stated. HMPH, seems your time spent with Freya did you some good, three years and you sure did mature, Mimir noted. As the head looks up and sees. Magi, has a mature face, with three whiskers like marks, an old scar on the left side of his face running vertically over the socket with a crystalline eye that is glowing in a golden light, blonde hair that is long enough to reach as braided around his ears and swept back into a ponytail. That reminds me, how's the eye brother? Not giving you any trouble? Mimir asks. Magdi shakes his head, no, the eye is fine. I just don't understand how you and Tyr were able to go through the procedures to have your eyes replaced with magic crystals, it was a pain when I first got it, but I am thankful that Freya managed to implant it when she did. Magdi said calmly, he also needed a few elemental goods to improve his weapons. He just hoped that there was a competent weaponsmith here that could do some things for his blades and axes, they had to make sure to gain every advantage over their enemies before they arrived. Brock and Sindri weren't coming for a couple of years and even then he only had basic skills to modify his weapons to fight Baldur when he arrived in the future. Mimir smiles, that's good to hear brother, now who among your old friends are planning on meeting first, Magdi? Or should I say, Naruto? That is not my name any longer. That pitiful excuse of a child died thirteen winters ago when he had a bolt of lightning shoved through his chest by a boy he considered his brother. I am Magdi. Son of Kratos and Lafi, brother to Atreus, said Naruto. Mimir only sighs, well I'm still gonna call you that since it is your real name and Magdi is just to cover up. Naruto drops the head, oh yes, way to kill my moment of being cool. Then you should call me by my proper name. Magdi is the one my parents gave me and I would like to honor that. Naruto stated before he sat down and pulled out a series of weapons. The first was an ornate hammer with dozens of runic carvings on both sides of the hammerhead. The hammer's characteristically short handle was due to a mistake during its manufacture if what Brock and Sindri said was true, but he was strong enough to lift the heavy hammer on his own much like his father could when they first killed Thor when he tried to kill both Kratos and Freya. Magni and Modi were strong, yes, but it took the combined strength of both brothers to lift the hammer up off the ground, and even then, they could only call on the hammer's base abilities to channel lightning. The second was a golden axe that had a short sword as a rear blade with hundreds of runic carvings along with the head of both blades and even the handle where one's hand would grab it. It was different from most battle axes since this axe was a single-handed axe making it a rare weapon. This was made when he took Magni's axe and had part of it melted down and then combined with some fire crystals from a dead fiery ancient and was imbued with the heart of an ice ancient to complete the trifecta of death that even made Kratos shiver at the sight of the axe. Ah yes. Jarngriper was a weapon that the gods should fear if Godslayer Kratos shivered at its power. The one weapon that could contend in might against the strength of Mjolnir with incredible ease. Finally, there were his father's blades, the Blades of Chaos, bestowed upon him by the mad battle maniac god of war Ares 300 years ago. The Blades of Chaos were forged at the darkest depths of the underworld by Ares himself. They were imbued with fire, which allowed them to ignite with every attack that the user performed. The blade's chains would stretch out for a set distance with each attack, allowing for fluid movement no matter who wielded them. When his father had begun his journey to the Norse lands, he brought them with him, and on their journey were imbued with the magic of the dwarves as they upgraded the blades and infused with the ability to control the winds of hell itself. As opposed to the ice-aspected leviathan axe, the blades give off the element of fire. Once upgraded progressively, the blades change gradually in appearance, restoring the cracked Greek blades into a more Nordic style, adding Nordic glyphs similar to the Leviathan axe. These glyphs glow fiery orange when ignited, and small runes written in Old Nordic decorate the edges of each blade. 
the hilts become gold in color and gain two slots on the skull's eyes. Additionally, each upgrade made by the Huldra brothers to the impressive blades was accompanied by an increasingly more intricate motif of a serpent or dragon just beneath the blade. Still can't believe your dog gave you those blades. No one man should bear the burden of the one set of weapons that have caused the downfall of so many gods. Mimir stated, Father's burden has long since brought him to places he shouldn't have gone. These blades are a dark weapon, and he needed to come to terms that he may have been a monster, but he was a monster controlled by the egos of gods. His burden is gone, and he can enjoy the remainder of his days in peace without having to feel the weight of these blades on his shoulders any longer. Naruto told Mimir, Well, they have killed an entire pantheon, just remember that. And your axe isn't anything to scoff at either, the mere fact it can wield three of the strongest elements in the world makes it the single greatest threat to the Norse pantheon and many others for its abilities. Even your father's blades can't match that kind of power nor Mjolnir when used by Thor after you had Brock and Sindri make it from scraps of Magni's blade after your dog killed him. Mimir stated. Well, it was infused with the Asgardian steel of Magni's blade as well as the heart of an ice ancient and fire crystal of a fire ancient, so it should be considered strong, and all the Aesir need to remember, that this weapon holds the remnants of one their own in it. As cocky as they are, they need to wake up to reality and remember, the humans control them as much as they contribute to humanity, he stated. You best pray that no other gods besides Odin and Baldr come for you, if not, even I cannot tell what fate has in store for you, despite you not being a person who prays to the gods for any form of help, Mimir told him. Well, let's just hope that none of the gods from this land become a problem for us. If they do, then they'll learn not to cross me as they do with father. Naruto said as he pulled out a couple of rags and brushes, and that Mimir, is a promise I intend to keep, he said as he picked up Mjolnir and began to polish the magical metal. Enough about gods, and it seems time went by, it's nearly sunset, we should start up camp brother, said Mimir, yeah true to that, or we could stay up here, and just start a fire, after all, there are trees above us, said Naruto as he points without looking, might as well. I bet you we have such amazing view of the night sky, said Mimir. Yup. And in the morning, we are going over to the hospital and have a long nice chat with Itachi, and ask him what is going on not just here, but everywhere else, said Naruto as he wipes the magical metal of Mjolnir as it shining with the light of the setting sun. Somewhere within the forest of the land of fire, both Dilchado and Adventretter are running from Blaze who is blasting them. The sound of fire crackling filled the air as the sounds of nature passed by. Next to a boiling pot of soup, Magdi or well Naruto should we say, sat stirring his meal. His cloak was removed, and his traveling companion head, Mimir, was on a rock with a book propped up for him to read under the moonlight as the stars shined overhead with resonating brightness. Before he could speak, Naruto turned the page where Mimir hummed in thanks as he continued to read while Naruto took the time to taste his meal. Nearby, his three weapons the hammer of Thor, the blades of chaos from Kratos, and his battle axe sat freshly sharpened or polished to perfection. Say lad, do you feel like we are not alone? Mimir asks. Naruto nods, yeah I know, I haven't been a ninja long time but there are things that have just come naturally to me, and that can sense things that ain't meant to be there. He picks up a little rock, flicks it and there's a yelp of pain as a body falls from the tree line. Nice shot brother, Mimir notes. Naruto places the stirring spoon down as he gets up and walks over to the person in question where he sees an Anbu with a style of a mask he has never seen before, and who, are you? He questions calmly as he grabs the Anbu by the throat to pick them up, but not to let him escape, they'll have their trachea ripped out if they shunshined away. The person is struggling hard trying to get free of the hold but he can't as it seems it was too strong and this is the first time this has happened and he can't even do the replacement jutsu, I will ask you again and don't expect a third one, Naruto stated before he spoke again, now tell me, who are you? Naruto asked calmly which line is striking fear in the person which shouldn't be possible. See code named, Tortoise, I serve the great tree that is the mighty Konoha, the Anbu stated. That's not enough, name, Naruto demanded, and the location of the others who are with you. I know you Anbu usually have a team of four, that's how you ninja operate. Naruto demanded. Before the man could answer, Naruto held up a hand and called his axe to him, and then sliced back, a cry of pain filling the air where he simply gripped his hand holding the anbu and twisted. 
The sound of the man's neck snapping filled the air before Naruto threw him away and turned around to see the other three, one holding a nasty cut for trying to attack him from behind. That answers that question. He stated before nodding, what do you want? He demands before the one he cut fell to the ground dead. One of two living Anbu says, that is a simple one, we know who you are and we are here to bring you to who you are meant to serve what you're truly meant to be, a weapon for our master. I have no master. Tell this mysterious master of yours, that if he wants me, he can come to get me himself. You should move on. He said before sitting back down at his fire, ignoring the two bodies next to him. As the other brings up a dagger that is covered in a venom that puts their targets in a paralyzing state, the effects would last long enough for them to take Naruto as was their mission. Mimir laughs, oh that's cute, a dagger to the back eh? Snorting, Naruto turns and says, that's not a dagger at all, it is a toothpick. He retorts, the Anbu not caring as he goes for the attack with the dagger in hand but it is caught by Naruto as he says, that's not even worthy enough to be called a dagger. He said as he reached to his hip, this is a dagger. He said holding the knife up. Then he thrusts the dagger into the guy's throat and blood is just spilling out. The Anbu falls down the side, dead, Naruto then looks at the last one, your last warning, leave. I don't think that's a good idea brother, if he leaves, more so since he knows who you are, and there goes your big surprise you had in mind, Mimir says. Naruto snorts as he watches the Anbu leap into the trees, I know, false sense of hope to let him escape before I did this. He said before hurling the golden axe into the woodline before a cry of pain filled the air before another squelching sound killed the cry as he holds out his hand and the axe returns. You know, I just can't get enough of that. He throws it toward the night sky then holds up his hand and the axe returns to him, see. It's just too cool, Naruto smirks. I can see that the crafters of those two brothers are outstanding, too bad they would fight all the time, says Mimir. Naruto nods, I have to agree with you but not everyone can get along, said Naruto, now then, time to get back to that pot, I am hungry after that little spar. Mimir raises a brow, doesn't your stomach ever fill up? At all, Mimir asks. The blonde rears his head back and roars in laughter, nope, never. Naruto laughs. Hokage Mountain. Don. Konoha Hopsital. In a certain hospital room, laying a man, who has black hair, black eyes, long, pronounced hair troughs, is wearing the white hospital robe, and what's more, he is very thin, devoid of fat and muscles, as he is just skin and bone and right now, a nurse is bringing a tray of food for him as she says, here you go Itachi-san, as she sets it down before leaving. Itachi stops her, nurse-san before you go, could you open the window, I would like some fresh air, he requests softly. Of course said the nurse as she walks over and opens it before she leaves the room it closes his eyes within a few seconds. You can come out, I know you're there, he says while the window's curtains move due to the wind and Naruto suddenly appears as he drops down to the floor silently. He's good brother, a lot better than the stories of him depict. A goat-like head says causing Itachi to raise a brow at this, it was certainly a first. Naruto, clad in his cloak with the hood pulled up, agrees readily, yeah even though being sickened, he looks at the state of Itachi's body, a shadow of his former self. Itachi says, you flatter me too much, I may be sick but I'm still sharp in most of my skills even though I can't move much of my body these days. Naruto nods and walks up to him and asks, do you know who I am without any clues? I can piece together some things, but right now, no. I can tell you have chakra, but at the same time, there is a sort of energy coursing through you that I cannot understand, though from what I can tell it is similar to chakra. As for your friend's head, he is flesh and blood, but an unknown technique has reanimated him without the need of a body. Wow, he's a really good brother, Mimir said. Then Itachi continues, besides that, on the other hand, given how your body stances, your garments, and speech pattern. I would say you hail from the north. Hidden cloud type north but farther north than most lands have on a map, seeing as the ninja world is still expanding and all. Remove your hood, and I'll be more inclined to speak with you. Itachi says. Naruto, without missing a beat, removes his hood, Itachi doesn't say anything. He just smiles as he says, have a seat, I'm sure we have much to talk about. Naruto sits down and removes the head from his belt and puts it on a table, we do. He agrees. Now then, 
said Itachi as he began cutting his food slowly, what would you like to know first? How long have you been bedridden? Naruto clasped his hands together as he leaned forward to look Itachi in his eyes. Itachi shakes his head with a chuckle, of all the things, you ask about me. He said with humor before inhaling deeply, well, it's been six years now, given my sickness that I spent years fighting off, trying to hold on long enough so Sasuke could kill me off for what I had done, but with what has happened, lot of things changes and the center of it, would be your, death, by Sasuke's hand. Itachi looks at Naruto, which by the way, you look rather well for a dead person, he notes. Naruto chuckles, while that is true I do look good, the truth is, I did not fake my death. Naruto said lifting the cloak to show the scar over his heart, your brother did kill me, but it was Maida who found me before everyone else. Now, what happened to the rookies? Ah yes, your friends, I don't know much given that well, I don't get many visitors but I do know what's going on with the ones belonging clans but that's not for me to say, said Itachi. Just tell me anything you know. I am not looking for secrets in jutsu. I do not need them, Naruto said. Well, your friend Neji Hayuga and his cousin Hinata are no longer part of the Hayuga clan. They've left. The fire daimyo outlawed the caged bird seal and other forms of subjugation and killed several of the elders to make a statement, but they found a new way to give the seal to those they deemed a threat to their leadership. They use a crude steel brand and mark them across the back for those who haven't had the original version on the forehead. This leaves a large scar that the bearer can cover up and keep hidden from prying eyes. Itachi said, as for the Hyuga clan head, that would be Hanabi, Hanada-san's younger sister. She saw fit to execute the remaining elders on account they broke the fire daimyo's law and united the two houses while letting Hanada and Neji strike out on their own. Neji has married a civilian woman named Aim and they have a son, Hazashi. He's six now, a good kid from what my summons tell me. Hanada remains on her own, declining the multitude of suitors that come ask for her hand, she remains celibate on account she publicly announced her affection towards you. As for Rock Lee, he's known as the greatest taijutsu master in all the elemental nations, surpassing his master made a guy, he teaches at the academy from time to time and owns a dojo where he teaches Monday to Friday with the weekends off. He married a woman named Matsuri from the Sand Village and has a son named Metal Lee, apparently, he wants to become a taijutsu master like his own father, he likes to challenge a young boy named after, their fallen friend. Naruto Serutobi, Konohamaru and Moegi's son. Shino Abarame works as a Jonin Academy teacher and Kiba works as a clan head and diplomat with other countries from time to time. He's good at what he does. Claims that death and violence don't solve everything. Does this in your honor? He goes to the memorial stone once a month and gives a toast of sake to your name. As for Tenten, she owns a weapons shop and blacksmith. She's created weapons that can rival those of the seven ninja swords of the mist and some even better. She doesn't get many suitors on account her tastes are exotic in some cases. Itachi says before humming. Neji, Hinata, Lee, Tenten, Shino, Kiba make six, ah of course. Your teammate Sakura remains adamant that my foolish brother remains innocent despite constantly killing leaf ninja and another ninja that comes after him. Though I wouldn't blame him for wanting to live as that's human nature, his ruthlessness is anything but. He sends the heads of those he kills to their villages back in a box asking if it is the best that they can offer. Your friend Shikamaru has married a young woman named Akriya Yuki from Kiri and they have twins. A boy and a girl. They named their son after you much like Konohamaru and his wife did, he's twelve. Now that I think about it, your name is rather popular and a lot of kids and chunin share it. Roughly 30 if my numbers are right. You seem to change a lot of people to the point they can't help but remember you. Even your old academy instructor and his wife Subaki named their eldest after you, he pointed out. Naruto has his head down during the time Itachi was as he couldn't help but let out a couple of teardrops as he says, I I see, d damn it, sorry just got something in my new eye, is something I'm still getting used to. While Mimir knows that was a lie, so, some of my friends are married, that that's good, though I'm surprised, I would have thought that Shikamaru would end up with Tamari. Oh don't get me started on that whole mess, it wasn't pretty, said Itachi shaking his head. Mimir says, you know, for a man who is bedridden and not getting visitors, you sure do know an awful lot, even if you had this summoning animal to help you out. Itachi says, 
Well there's many crows can do, that's why I relied on the gossip of the nurses, they hear a lot of things. That, and nobody would suspect a crow of spying on certain conversations. Itachi says. Sheesh, that kind of sneakiness reminds me too much of Odin. That, and the ties to the ravens. Mimir stated. Naruto says, anyway, what do you mean by Hinata moved out of the Hyuga clan compound? Itachi looks at him and shakes as he laughs softly, that is something I'm still in the dark about, but whatever caused her to move out, she becomes a very much different person than you remember. She's cold to her family, ruthless to her enemies, and her suitors. She despises men in general now, but she has taken a couple of female lovers, but it was years ago and she remained celibate ever since. Naruto shakes his head, damn. Nodding, Itachi says, I think that's because she couldn't truly another, mostly due to her heart, or whatever reminds within her, belongs to you, Naruto is surprised to hear that. Don't tell her I said that, she's also a medical ninja and she doesn't have the gentle touch like your friend Ino. Speaking of her, she is regarded as the, next Tsunade Senju, due to her skills. She leads her clan very well and adopted a young boy named Hashirama. The kid loves gardening and has a powerful earth affinity. Forgot about her, to be honest. He shakes from remembering their massive needles to draw out blood during the early years of his stay. I see, so now then, can you tell me about this though, he shows him a bloodstained mask of the Anbu from last night. Itachi looks at it, hum though it looks updated most of it is still the same. He said, this is a root mask, where did you get it? Itachi questions. A squad of them attacked my campsite last night trying to get me as a weapon to their jester of a leader, some man that I was unable to get the name of. Called me his weapon before I slaughtered them and destroyed the remains, said Naruto. Itachi says, Danzo is the man you are looking for, this is from his little following of drones. He forces them to rid themselves of emotion by killing someone they're raised with, in a fight to the death. Believes he should be the Hokage due to the Haino Ishii that Lord Hashirama created dying with him. Says that men are tools, and emotions are a weakness. He told Naruto handing the mask back. Naruto takes the mask and puts it away, so do you know what he has done for crimes more than removing emotions? Naruto asks. Yes, I do, he kidnapped children with great potential and or unique traits, not just from Konoha, but other villages as well. He takes those from well-known clans, mostly orphanages used to house them until another clan member can care for them. Itachi answered. Mimir blinks in confusion, if you know this, why did you not tell the leader of this place? He asks as he doesn't understand why Itachi didn't report this info. Because Danzo is a dangerous man, he may seem like an old man, but you have to remember this, he was trained by both the first and second Hokages, he knows jutsu that many had forgotten, secrets that are far too damaging, and he has seen much death and fought wars than Naruto and I could have possibly known. Naruto nods, that is understandable now that you say it, but if he keeps it up then I am going for his head. Itachi says, if you do, make sure you give him two for me and my best friend, will you? What do you mean? Naruto asks. He's a grave robber to boot. Even stole the eyes from members of my clan and grafted them onto an arm made of Lord First Cells. He was exposed by a ninja a while back, but grave robbing a founding clan isn't enough to warrant execution. He used a forbidden jutsu on the daimyo, Koto Amatsukami, and made him exempt from the charges used against him by claiming it was to the glory of Konoha. Itachi told him. Oh that man is not a man, he is a monster, said Mimir in anger. As he adds, the things he has done, hell, compared to certain gods, this Danzo fellow makes them look like saints, and Odin was the man who allowed Thor to slaughter all the giants in Midgard. Mimir stated. Naruto nods, I agree with you Mimir. This man is a monster and he will get his due in the end. Just like Thor did when we killed him and his sons as we will with Balder when he comes to us as we planned. Itachi takes their words with a grain of salt but nods to that, let's see, what else can I tell you? Oh, he then explains everything that Naruto had missed out on. Gara married the clan head of the Hazuka clan Nozumi Hazuka to broker peace with the two nations and had a son, who was also ironically named Naruto in remembrance of Gara's first and best friend apparently he was just as hyper as the blonde was in his youth. The ceasefire between Kumo and Konoha, how Iwa withdrew to build up their strength, several minor villages expanded and were on the cusp of becoming major villages. 
he explains pretty much everything else, and then some, when he is finished, and that's what has happened the past 12 years. Naruto nods and he says, thank you, he says softly. Itachi says, it's not much of a problem, it's nice to have someone to talk to, even though it means it will be my last one. Naruto looks at him and is reminded of Itachi's illness, and the way he said, it likely means. Itachi's time is running out and soon. You know brother, those healing crystals you usually carry can fix just about anything and everything aside from death itself. Mimir points out to him gaining curious looks from both men. Naruto grunts and then pulls out a crystal and looks at it, that is true but it is not my choice to make. It is up to Itachi. Mimir grunts in understanding as Naruto looks toward Itachi and he asks, if I say yes, what do you want in return? Naruto says, keep our conversation a secret, I will reveal myself when I am ready and not a moment before I am ready. Itachi nods, very well then. Your visit is safe between us, besides, no one visits, so your secret is safe with me. Naruto sees Mimir moving his eye toward Itachi, and asks, so you're giving brother permission? Nodding, Itachi says, yes I am. Would you please heal me? He asks as he holds out his hand where Naruto places a glowing green rock in his palm then adds pressure to the crystal as it breaks, a wave of green light washing over Itachi before enveloping him only to die down just as quickly. The illness is cured, but to fully heal, that is only something you can do. The crystal can only do so much. Naruto informs him, sorry there is not much more I could have done for you. Naruto apologizes. This is more than enough. With this, I can ease the burden of my brother's selfish acts of vengeance and greed for power. I thank you, Itachi says. Naruto nods and asks, also I heard a rumor that you were going blind by overusing your eyes. He asks, is this true? Nodding, Itachi says, yes, it's drawback for gaining the more powerful form of the Sharingan, the Mangeku, there are no other ways to go around it, besides getting a pair of them from someone who has it as well, as he is feeling so much better, which he hasn't for a long time. Naruto nods and then gets up and picks up Mimir's head, I will see you later, Itachi. For now, I must leave, I cannot have my secret being exposed and I can sense a worker coming this way he says as he heads to the window, until we meet again, Itachi Uchiha, son of Fugaku Uchiha and Makoto Uchiha, he bids the man farewell and exits the room in a gentle breeze of wind. Then the door opens and it's the same nurse from before holding a bowl of ice cream in her hand, Itachi-san, I know I shouldn't be here given you're unwell, but I thought maybe I would give you some ice cream, is that alright? She asks as Itachi smiles towards her. You know, that sounds very nice the Uchiha says politely. Unknown location. It was dark out. A small fire was burning, the snow not bothering the camper as she sat at the edges of the flame to keep away the cold. She has long shoulder-length dark hair with some of it being tied in a braid with several strands of her braids being beaded. She wears a light brown dress with animal skins and a dark brown leather dress with intricate Nordic patterns and gold inlaid into the lower part of the dress. She also wears a bright orange shirt and has a series of runic tattoos on her arms. She's also barefoot and very tall for her gender as she stood at a generous 5 foot 9 inches, just under a certain blonde godling's height of 6 foot 3 inches. She has a curvy figure with double E.E. cup breasts, wide hips that many would agree were perfect for childbearing. This is Freya, former leader of the Veneer gods, and right now, she wants answers, so you're telling me, Naruto has gone off to his homeland, dot for what? She looks at the man who trained and sees Naruto as a son. The man appears older, with several wrinkles on his face looking to be in his mid to late fifties or sixties. His goatee has grown into a bushy, full beard that covers half his face and has several grey hairs. His skin is still pale and covered with the ashes of his Spartan family, and his tattoos have faded slightly. He retains the scar on his abdomen, However, it is larger and less jagged than before due to him stabbing himself at the end of his conquest against his former pantheon. Also from the same wound, he now has a long scar covering almost all of his lower back. He wears black leather pants and shoes, also present are faded scars from where the chains from the blades were attached to his forearms, which he prefers to keep covered beneath with what appears to be fur-lined leather, secured with thongs of leather. The man, Kratos says, Yes, he told me that he wanted to go there. To see how things were in his former homeland, as he chopped up a tree.
Freya shakes her head in exasperation, and you let him go. Just like that, while knowing that he has a target on his back. From Odin, from Baldur, and half the Aesir under the Allfather's command. Says Freya. He's a grown man, he doesn't need my permission to come and go as he pleases, Freya, he will be fine. Besides he has Mimir to help with information. Along with what he has learned with you while I was journeying with Atreus to the summit of the mountain and what he learned from me when we arrived in these lands. Besides those lands are under the protection of the Shinto pantheon, they do not take kindly to outsiders coming in without permission, their hunt will not be so easy, he tells her. And you forget, Odin controls the veneer, and through them, the veneer magic. He can create the protection staves that can hide them from the pantheon of his homeland. He's more than a mere mortal. The minute he slew Magni and Modi his blood became that of the gods. And you know as well as I do, that the blood you gave him did more than save his life, it prolonged it to a length far beyond a regular mortal, you made him a demigod. Now he is a full-fledged god from slaying the sons of Thor and Thor himself cursing him to live as one of us. She sighs as she shakes her head, he is in more danger than we could ever hope to realize. You should not have let him go back, she told him. Freya, you don't think I know that? Do you honestly think I won't let him go without believing he can take care of himself? I trained him, raised him as my own, and gifted him all I know, given him the very thing I swore I would never bestow upon, the blades that I tried to bury in the past to live for a better future. Kratos said calmly but sternly to the younger goddess. Naruto, he is young but also strong and can think in the heat of battle, and unlike me, he does not succumb to rage and anger without reason. He knows who to kill and who does not, he is kind but also cold. Both he and Atreus have something I had long since lost, and that is humanity. Like all men do, he will live and fight, and all we can do is to pray that he returns home. Here, father, I got some, he said, putting a basket of fish down. This was Kratos' blood son, Atreus who was truthfully a half-giant god teen. He is a young man of thirteen with brown hair and a scarred pale face. The scar on his face is pale resembling the marking Demos has, possibly a sign of greatness. He has light freckling and icy blue eyes. He is dressed in leather and hides of fur. Additionally, the sash around his waist is remarkably similar to Kratos's loincloth during his time in Greece, red with golden patterns around it. Good, help me prep them, Kratos says softly as he grabs a knife and cuts into the fish. Then Atreus notices Freya. Oh Freya if you are looking for Naruto, he's not here. Kratos says, she already knows, boy, and she is deciding whether or not to go after your brother. He guts another fish. Lake of the Nine, Gateway Shop. Two dwarves were excited. Why, may you ask? Well, that was simple. They had avenged the hundreds of giants they had inadvertently helped the Esir slaughter through the centuries. Sure it wasn't by their hands that it happened but it was through their crafting of a weapon of equal if not greater strength that the act of vengeance had been carried out. Mjolnir was no longer their masterpiece, what had once been a symbol of their name being brought up from the destructive forces of the greedy and selfish Esir now basked in a glorious like of protection and peace in the form of a battleaxe that controlled the aspects of fire, ice, and thunder itself. Thor had stood no chance when he had come knocking about looking for the trio of bastards they called their clients after the fat dauber's son had fallen in battle to the blonde punk ass. Yes, they could sleep peacefully now after countless years of restless nights from their selfish desire to be recognized as the best craftsmen in the Nine Realms. Brock, a blue dwarf with golden armor covered in soot, looked at his brother in curiosity while smirking as he hammered a piece of scop slag, you sure you wanna go there? The things we've been doing here have made us so much better, he stated. Sindri, a dwarf in shiny golden armor with long red gloves who was also Brock's brother, nodded his head, oh yes, think of all the things we could come across, the rare ingredients we could use if we make things with them, the people, the landscapes we'll pass by on the journey, he tells his brother. As the blue one says, you sure, you tend to just freak out, over everything, he said as he started getting his things together. Sindri waves his brother off, I will be fine, I'm sure where we are going will be clean, said Sindri as he tried not to think such things. Brock snorts in amusement but nods, yeah I agree but I just need to get our stuff ready. Brock says, I wonder if there's meat over there, he wonders. Sindri gives his brother a blank look, seriously, out of everything, 
Mead is the first one that comes to the front of your mind. Brock couldn't answer that. We're off to a far land we've never been to. Far from our home, there's the possibility of new things we couldn't think of, and you just think of Mead. Brock laughs heartily as he says, Never thought I would see the day you would tell me off. It's strange, good, but strange. Blushing in embarrassment, Sindri says, Why yes, T that was way out of line, so um should we carry on then? Brock's laughter rang through the temple as he helped his brother continue packing. Unknown location. The tracks led south, far south. But why would he go on this kind of journey on his own? The blonde punk was stronger than the bearded man and his boy of a brother. The man doing the tracking has a unique body build, as it makes him seem small in comparison to the other male gods in his homeland of Asgard, who are generally of towering height and sport broad, heavily muscled builds. His most striking features are his woad blue tattoos of Nordic runes, which coat large portions of his limbs and torso, and his eyes, which are distinctly icy blue, particularly noticeable when someone is looking at his face close up. He has handsome, if haggard, features, with a beaded but unkempt brownish beard and a shaggy, beaded horse mane hairstyle. He wears a red belt, a hip pouch, and a thin string of charms over a torn brown waistcloth sash, which is worn over loose, black cloth pants, bound at the calves with brown leather straps. He wears no top and no shoes. This, was Balur, the god of the light and Odin's best tracker. But most knew him as, the man who cannot be killed due to a spell his mother cast upon him a century ago. The hunt was on, and he would bring justice for the Allfather for his brother's death. As he says, soon blonde one, I will find you and then I will make you pay for killing my brother. He makes as he follows Naruto's track, unknowing walking into other gods' lands that ain't his to enter. However, the protection stave spell was already on his neck, preventing any deity from so much as sensing his power until it was too late. Konoha. Noon. Naruto, with the hood on, is walking around as he is thinking of who to see first. As he walks, he bumps into someone. I am sorry, my head was in the clouds, said Naruto as he stands back up. Looking at the one he bumped into, he sees Tamari. Shaking her head the blonde woman smiles, oh it's you Maji, she says looking at him. Naruto nods with Mimir thinking, oh fate, ain't you funny thing. Tamari says, so how have you been? She says trying to make small talk as she didn't expect to see Maji so soon. Naruto says, it is all right as it happens that last night someone tried to take me to be a weapon. Tamari is surprised to hear that and feels her eyes widen in shock, what? By who? Just point me at them and I will handle it, she says. Shaking his head, Naruto says, no need, I already handled it myself. Tamari blinks as she says, ooh, oh okay, as she thinks, damn it, I met him less than a day ago, why am I like this? Naruto explains what happened and even shows the dagger they had, as this is going on, soon enough, both stop what they are doing and hear. Oh a beauty such as yourself, deserves the finer things in life such as this, says a man who holding a case as it displays a necklace with many gems with silver and such as stands in front of it, a woman who is twenty-five years old, with indigo blue hair as it long and a thin ponytail and white eyes, as she wearing a light purple shirt with no sleeves, as it hugging onto her large breasts of H using a headband as a belt, bandages around her lower arms wearing long dark pants. This is Hanada Hayuga, formerly of the Hayuga clan. And to Naruto, he remembers seeing a sweet kind yet shy and always red on her face girl but the memory of that girl has long since faded away as the expression on the now older Hanada's face, is cold and ruthless, and very much isn't impressed by both the man and his gift that he's presenting. As she doesn't say anything she just turns away and walks off as a sign of rejection not caring about it and the man turns into stone as he says, B but this cost almost 50,000 Rio, a whole S rank mission. Naruto snorts at that as he has seen much more expensive shit and he also has more expensive gems on his person. Then he hears Tamari say, well, there goes another fool soul trying to impress the queen of ice. She would admit that she feels sorry for the guy, it was an impressive necklace. Naruto just, HMMS, at that, you know that name is not right for her. Truthfully, it should be the queen of the frozen tundra, said Naruto. Giggling, Tamari says, that sounds about right, given as Hinata pretty much blocked off everything, and yes that's her actual name, Magdi. She looks at him. Naruto nods as the guy is crying as he failed to win, 
or at last, melt the ice heart of Hinata. Then Naruto looks toward where Hinata, as he thinks, what could have happened that made her this way. Tamari says, say Magdi. Naruto is pulled out of his thoughts, since I'm heading back to my village soon, I was thinking that maybe we could get to K who the fuck are they? Cries out as she looks behind Naruto. Naruto looks behind him and sees people are running as three men cut through swaths of ninja of high caliber, Jonin and Anbu alike before Naruto growls as they take notice of him and point in his direction, travelers, of course, they bring their barbaric practices here, he snarls as he reaches behind his back. Brother, I would highly suggest not doing open combat here, remember what happened the last time you fought in a town square, it was ruined, and several people lost their lives, including your enemy, Mimir says. Yes, but these nuisances are not Thor, and their flesh is vulnerable to steel. Naruto says pulling Jarngriper from its clasp in the middle of his back and whirling it around, so let's have some fun Mimir. Like the old days. The old days. There are no old days with you. Those days were less than a year ago ya daft fool. The head shouts as Naruto runs toward the three heavily armored men with his axe, this is a bad idea. Mimir called out, Magdi. He cries. As Tamari is confused about what is going on as she unhooks her fan and says, hold on, you shouldn't fight these things alone. Stay out of this, Naruto roared back at her as he raised the axe over his head. Somewhere else in Konoha, Hanada appeared at her apartment, not knowing what was going on in the place she was, she opened the door and walks in, as she walks in, she just lets out a sigh as it had been a long two days, more so, since yesterday, as she had a long shift at the hospital. She just wants to take a shower and then go to sleep. She walks over there to her restroom. There's not much, besides seats, a TV, a table for her to eat on, kitchen, but there are no photos of anything, not even one with her old team, teammate, though she had stopped talking with them. As she enters the restroom, she starts taking off her clothes which reveal a bit of muscle under her apparel as well as taking off her bandages, and soon she is fully naked. She faces the shower, turns on the warm water, and waits for the water to heat up causing condensation to appear on the mirror and window. Opening the shower curtain, the fogging mirror shows something on her back. A burnt, messy mark of the caged bird branding that her family attempted to practice and failed, and Hinata is the living embodiment of that. And harbors to live with it, for the remainder of her life. Hinata hates it so much that it is annoying as she enters the shower and begins washing. Play. ACDC. Money Talks. Steel clashed with a resounding rumble that shook the ground. Naruto leapt up and spun as he smashed his foot into the middle man's face, at the same time he hurled his axe at the right man, forcing him to raise his gigantic sword and block it. The man Naruto had kicked is sent skidding back. As this happened, Naruto's prosthetic had already moved to grab a blade from his back. Spinning in the air, Naruto throws the blade a chain extending out and wrapping itself up around the left man's arm where Naruto gives a yell and pulls hard, dragging him towards Naruto's free hand as he slams Mjolnir into his armored chest. Landing, Naruto raises his hand and catches his axe, and spins, cutting through the metal shield of the man his leg had kicked and made it break apart. Spinning, he catches the blade and spins right, once again releasing the blade into the air as he catches Mjolnir at the same time and swings up slamming the head of the hammer into the chin of the right traveler causing him to get ripped off the ground. Releasing the hammer, Naruto turns left and catches his golden axe and swings down on the sword, aiming to bisect him from below and cuts into the blade as he catches the blade of chaos in his empty hand and lashes out to the front, forcing the man to bring up his large shield before Naruto turns around and catches Mjolnir. Tamari watches transfixed and wide-eyed as her new acquaintance takes on the three heavily armored men using weapons of unique designs and incredible efficiency. The ninja around her is awed by the man's prowess. Where before these men had been cutting through Jonin so easily despite them using powerful jutsu, this man was using bare hands and weapons like this was a walk in the park. Incredible, I don't think any of us can match that kind of prowess. Who is this guy? A man asks as he watches Madgo release the axe where it rapidly spins in the air easily a dozen times, remaining in place before returning to the cloaked man's hand as he sliced up, and smashed the head of his hammer into the pommel of the axe, shattering the blade where dozens of pieces of steel filled the air before a chain wrapped around his neck and pulled him into a shield on the man's forearm. His name is Foran, I think he's from a northern land, another ninja says in shock. This is incredible, 
I never expected a foreigner to have such strength. The first ninja says as Naruto jumps into the air and brings Mjolnir down on one of the armored men's heads, a crackle of thunder filling the air before a white bolt of lightning shot down from the sky and caused a powerful explosion to fill the air with dust and rubble. Who is this guy? A man with dark brown hair and pale eyes asks. This was Neji Hayuga, and even though he couldn't see anything, the cloak was concealing the man's identity in a shroud that blocked his Byakugan's ability to see through everything. His name is Magdi, son of Margus and Magda. Tamari said as she watched as a head fell from the left man's shoulder, the body followed shortly after. Magi ha, huh? how curious. Naruto yells as he summons some magic and ignites his axe and hurls it at the right man, forcing him to block as he hurls a blade out to the left, wrapping it around the body of the man he aimed at. With a surge of raw strength, Naruto picked the man up off the ground and pulled him up through the air and over his head where he slammed him into the ground, the chain blazing red with fire along its length the blade itself crimson with heat. With a grunt, he surged the magic of fire through the blade, an explosion of fire filling the air before he catches Mjolnir in his hand and turns a full 360, and hurls the hammer, crackling with lightning at the charging traveler on his right. The armored man leaps to the left, but the hammer still hits true and a blast of lightning fills the air and surges through both men's armor as Naruto catches his axe and blade and hurls them forward at the same time. Ice was now coating his axe and fire filled the air as the blade of Kratos flew at its target. The two weapons were spaced so close together one would have thought he might hit the returning hammer, but the space was just perfectly measured that the hammer slipped through as it spun in the air. Naruto was in the process of spinning around as he caught Mjolnir in hand and called on the hammer's ability to summon lightning as he once more hurled it at the right armored man, barely missing the rotating axe as the blonde caught it in his grip and leapt into the air slicing up with the chained blade and hitting the hammer in time to send it up into the air above the two men. Fire, ice, lightning all filled the air as Naruto sliced down and struck with all three weapons, the explosion that went off forced all his observing crowd members to cover their faces as a powerful shockwave blasts them in the face. A blinding light causes them to close their eyes as the explosion lights up the square. However, Naruto wasn't bothered by this and swung his axe down, slicing into the right man's head, killing him in the process. Spinning around, Naruto catches the hammer and hurls it at the man while catching both his blade and axe where he jumps into the air and flips before he releases both at the last man and the ground is once again rocked by the elemental fury of the weapons unleashing their attacks. With that, the last man is defeated. Naruto catches Mjolnir and straps it to his waist and holds his hand up and catches his glowing axe in his right hand while his left grasps the blade of chaos in its grip the fire of battle slowly dying down as he places it back on his back, and as usual, they all think that their precious armor will protect them from my strength. Arrogance, much like those Aesir, was their downfall, Naruto said, spitting on the last man before turning around and walking off. However, Naruto hadn't fully killed the last man as he had thought, and the man was quick to rise. Surprisingly quiet as he moved. It wasn't until Mimir heard the movement of the man's sword slicing through the air that Naruto made his move, brother lookout. The head cried as Naruto ducked down, the traveler's sword catching his cloak and ripping it off as Naruto spun and sliced up, cutting through the man's armor and removing his right arm. With a roar, Naruto turns his axe and slices down, cutting deeply into the gushing shoulder of his enemy, killing him for good as he pushes the blade out of the way from his secret attacker. With a snort, Naruto placed his foot on the man's chest and pushes him off where the traveler falls to his back, he did not know who he was fucking with. Naruto stated. Brother, the cloak, Mimir called out, Naruto looks at it lying on the ground and growls as he says. Damn it, Ma had to fix it before we left on our journey. He holds whatever is left of it in his hand, the cloak ripped in two from the traveler's blade. Mimir is wide-eyed, forget that brother you no longer have anything to hide your face. Said Mimir. It took a few moments for Naruto to understand his meaning, but by then it was too late. His identity was revealed, finally getting what Mimir meant aloud, shit. Filled the air from Naruto as he looks behind and well, he sees a mass collection of stares of shock, disbelief, and, fear of this is a trick. Started with Neji. N Naruto said the male Hyuga as he first walked up to him hoping it was not some sick game that an enemy is playing at, or worse a ghost that came back to hunt them. Naruto doesn't say anything, you're not some ninja from another village who is using the face of Naruto Uzumaki, if you are, 
By Kami's might I will. Neji was cut off. No, I'm not an enemy using a ninjutsu to use my face. Nor I'm a ghost, I'm the real deal, well mostly. He says motioning to his eye and arm. Neji is having a hard time believing it. If it means anything to you. I made an oath with the blood of Hinata on my hand back Chunin exams after you beat the hell out of her, and I kept my word by punching you on the chin from underground even after you blocked my chakra, says Naruto with a smirk as he used his metal hand to point at the chin. Neji looks at him with wide eyes as he says, you are him, cause there's not that many know about the blood oath you made. Then tears begin to form, d damn it, I should have known. I should have to know someone like you won't go down that easily says neji wiping his eyes hey hey now you shouldn't be crying neji man says naruto the fault of my battle with sasuke was mine and mine alone i chose to try and bring him back it's nobody's fault that he nearly killed me he urges one of the other ninjas who are younger than some of the older ninjas says so who is that guy he looks like that naruto guy from the photo back at the academy while pointing to naruto as they ask one of their more senior fellow ninjas Next to them, a junin who has a few greys in his hair says, son of a bitch, he's somehow come back from the grave. Tamari looks at the long lost ally with tears as she thinks, Gara, he's alive, the one who saved you, is alive. Where have you been, we all thought you were dead, Neji asks him in disbelief. Well, after my fight with Sasuke, I was laying in a pool of my blood. Sasuke had used the Chidori to cut my arm off and had cut my eye out with a kunai beforehand. I managed to cut out one of his own eyes and even took an ear as compensation. Anyways, as I lay on the ground, a man who was leaving his homeland came upon me and started treating my injuries. Suffice to say I lived, and he asked me what my intentions were. I explained to him what had all happened and said I needed to grow stronger to fulfill my goals. So we struck up a bargain. He would train me and I would help him leave to find a better place to live. Well, we would soon meet a woman by the name of La Fee, or Fei as he called her, and she would become his wife and the mother of his son. Over time, I would be seen as their son, and they, my parental figures. However, my adoptive mother developed an illness and died when we were unable to treat her. My little brother, Atreus, would journey with us to spread her ashes as per her wish. I was unable to make a large portion of the journey due to only having a single arm and an eye, but a pair of brothers managed to craft me one while I stayed at a mutual friend's house until they returned and I got used to the new arm. He waves his metal fingers at Neji, and an eye as well. Naruto explained as he motioned to the Bifrost crystal in his socket where his old eye would have been. Neji is in disbelief, then says, so you just been over in some other land. Where no one could find you. For more than a decade. Yeah which reminds me as I think about it, I know I signed the toad summoning, they should have known where I have been. Unless something happened that severed my contact with them, Naruto said as he realized that. Neji inhales deeply, I'm getting too old for this shit. He muttered before looking to some ninja, alright, get these people out of here, and call the hazardous cleanup team. I want these bodies in the R&D department immediately with stasis seals on them and a full guard on the bodies and armor with only those I sign off on being able to get anywhere near them. He commanded. He was the Jonin commander, he could make calls like that. Shikamaru is working as the Hokage's advisor so he couldn't pull that kind of weight. Neji turned to Naruto and motioned for him to follow, as for you, it'd be best if you came with me. I think it'd be nice to show you some people who've missed your presence most. He said as he started walking off, Naruto following soon after. Well brother, it's not what you hoped for, but it is what it is, Mimir said. What's with the talking head? Neji asked, he'd seen weirder over his time as John and Commander. Me, I'm the greatest ambassador to the gods, the giants, and all the creatures of the Nine Realms. I know every corner of these lands, every language is spoken, every war waged, every deal ever struck. They call me, Mimir, smartest man alive, and I have the answer to your every question. Mimir states almost smugly as he uses his introduction again. Okay, why are you in head that can talk? Neji asked. I asked his daughter to cut it off so I could escape my unjustified imprisonment. Then we had a friend of sorts use her abilities to reanimate me. Though his daughter was a bit of an ass and showed me my still imprisoned corpse, he explained. Huh, go figure. Naruto stops and says, Tamari. Tamari looks at him, 
Yes. Tamari asked him, still shocked by the revelation of Naruto being uncloaked. Naruto games at her with his mismatched eyes, how about we get a drink, just you and me? After I finish this tour of the village, he says. As in what? A catching up oh, no lass, he's asking you on a date, said Mimir, though he was grinning at the words he spoke. Not exactly, but in a sense yes, a date. Naruto sighs out, blushing Tamari as she thought. AAAD date. Naruto says, I'll see y'all later. He tells her before he goes off with Neji while Neji had sent a ninja to gather every armored person up as he ordered. Half of hour later, outside of the Hokage Tower, Naruto is leaning against a stone lion and out of view as he yawns and says, So tell me again, why are we waiting out here? With Neji standing in front of the doors. Smiling softly, Neji says, I just wanted to make it a surprise as all, I haven't seen either of them for a while now. Naruto has his metal hand in Neji's eyesight as he gives a thumbs up. I thought we would be talking to your chieftain or however you call the title of your village leader, said Mimir. Neji snickers, it's Hokage, and I thought so too, said Naruto. As Neji is looking at the corners of the road, this takes a while, so much so that Naruto falls asleep. When someone arrived, one of Neji's former teammates, a woman who is the same age as Neji with brown hair though she usually wore her in a pair of twin buns back in the day, now she just lets it down. She has dark brown eyes as she wears a white Chinese style top which hugged onto her beasts of double E with tight skin shorts as it hugged onto her womanly legs while carrying a large scroll on her back. This is Tenten and she is running. But a bit out of shape, running a store all day long does that. Tenten, said Neji as he saw her coming up. She comes to a stop with a deep breath as she says, I got your message, so what's up? She asked him, though she didn't know what was going on only to get word from a messenger that Neji wanted to see her, as well as everyone else. I will tell you when the others arrive. He tells her, it's something that's best to show everyone at once, said Neji. As Tenten sighs, she says, I hope it's worth closing shop today. She crossed her arms under her breasts and her eyes closed. Then she smiles softly and asks, so how's your life so far? Your family doing good, she asks him. Hazashi and Kawaki are doing just fine. Hazashi has been improving his Jukan surprisingly and Kawaki has awoken his Byakugan, though it's only in one eye surprisingly enough. He also inherited a strong water affinity. I hope Lady Hinata won't mind teaching him how to use her water-based style when I ask her, he said politely. Before Tenten could respond, a loud cry of, Yash, it is so youthful to see you today Neji, caused Tenten to cringe from the loudness. I see Lee hasn't changed all that much. Tenten giggles. Yay, he hasn't changed at all. That's the one good thing about him. Neji laughs. It was then a tall man who was incredibly muscular with surprisingly defined cheekbones, wearing a sleeveless dark green jumpsuit with an orange neck warmer. Landed next to them, Yosh. I stick the landing. Ten out of ten. Lee exclaims loudly before looking at his teammate and sees Tenten next to his best friend and cries out in joy, oh. T-E-N-T-E-N-Chan, you look so radiant and youthful today, Yash. As expected of the world's foremost weapons crafter and weapons mistress. Youth shines out of each pore like a million stars T-E-N-T-E-N-Chan. Naruto from his spot has a deadpan face on him as he thinks, to be honest with me, I forgot that bushy brow is so damn loud and I think he's gotten louder through the years. Mimir whispers, brother, I I think I'm going deaf. There's this long high pitch ringing going on in my ears, and I'm a decaying head for Ragnarok's sake. Neji smiles warmly and says, it's good to see you too Lee. Before he gives Lee a quick hug, then he notices a few bugs flying and not just any normal bugs, as it is the kinkajou bugs that certain clans use. Neji says, I'm glad you could make it as well, Shino. Before he looks and sees a man who gives off a vibe of a teacher, Sensei wearing a flak jacket with two bug-like emblems on the neck, and a full body suit underneath. While on duty he wears a three-strip optic visor that wraps around his head. This is Shino Aburame, nodding, he says, hello Neji-san, he walks up to the members that once made up Team Guy. Waving a hand, Neji says, I'm sorry to have to pull you out of your class during a lesson. It's fine, the kids were about to head home anyway and our early release never hurts every once in a while, the bug user says politely. So, where are the others? Neji asked Shino, 
Shino snorts. Kiba went to grab a bite before coming. He said he hasn't eaten yet and felt it'd be best to grab a burger for him and Akamaru before they made their way here. Shouldn't be too long. As for Hanada, she's coming. He simply said, inhaling deeply. Remember, if you speak of the devil he shall appear, Yahoo. Everyone hears before they look up and see a man with shoulder-length brown hair with dark-toned skin with red fang-like tattoos on his cheek with a goatee on the chin, wearing a jacket with a bit of fur, white shirt, this is Kiba Inazuka. And beside him is a large white fur dog, though it gives off an aura of an old dog, with a few fights left with him, this is Akamaru. Both landed while carrying bags of burgers as he talked with a bag in his mouth, yo, sup guys. Kiba cheered as he took his burger out of his mouth, you said you were calling the gang together for something big, so here I am. He grinned happily. Kiba, can you control yourself? An irate woman stated drawing their attention to Hinata as she walked up to them. And her hair looked a bit wet as she was in the shower before getting the message. Kiba just looks at her with him thinking, nice to see you too ice queen, as she just walks past him. Hinata ignores the others as she looks at her cousin, well, you wanted us here, so here I am. She said, placing her hands on her hip. All in due time Lady Hanada. Let's wait for the others to come. Neji said politely. Hanada just rolls her eyes and walks up and away from the others as Tenten whispers to Neji. She's, delightful, as always. Though Neji doesn't answer that. Soon enough a large man with light brown hair. Years ago when he was young, he had two long pointy hair buns but now it's hanging low and waving in the wind. He stood tall and proud and smiled warmly with light pink swirls on his cheeks, wearing a shirt with the kanji, food, with a green light jacket and carrying a bag of chips. This is Choji Akamichi. Hey everyone, nice to see all of you. It's been a while since we all came together like this. Choji said warmly, as everyone but one says their hellos is soon enough, the door leading inside opens up and behind it is Choji's old teammate. A man with a small goatee and his hair swept back into its usual ponytail walks out waving, sup y'all. I see everyone here's gotten Neji's surprise message huh? He asks, smiling broadly. Then he notices Hanada. Oh she's even here too. He grumbles before nodding her way, hey Hanada, break any more hearts. He waves to her and Hanada doesn't say anything. And finally, the last one is everyone hears, I can't believe I'm the last one shouted a woman with long light blonde hair with light blue eyes, with eyeshadow, red lipstick wearing mostly purple clothes hugging her double F's long skirt and by the look of her eyes she didn't get much sleep, partly due to her being one of the best medical ninjas. Ino Yamanaka was still willing to greet the day with a smile, tired or not, I'm just glad you made it Ino, said Neji with the blonde girl smirking. Smirking at her old friend she says, so you said in your message you have a surprise for us. So what is it? As Neji is about to answer that, a voice calls out to them, much to their dread as they turn to see a woman with long pink hair and green eyes wearing a red dress and she doesn't look that much different for the past 12 years, this is Sakura Haruno. A former teammate of Naruto and Sasuke. Sakura says, you guys, what are you all doing here? Wait, don't tell me, have you guys finally realized that Sasuke is innocent and finally wanna talk some sense into Lady Tsunade? Hanada snorts and rolls her eyes as she says, give me a break. As if you pink-haired bitch. The day I believe that murdering backstabber is innocent, will be my death day, not happening. She growled. Neji steps in before anything can escalate. Calm down you two. I didn't call all of us here for an argument about who is innocent or not. This is more serious than any of that, more than that it involves the team that went on the mission that day. He said, causing all of them. Hanada and Sakura especially, to pause as they look at Neji in confusion. Uh, Neji, all of us that went on that mission except Naruto are here, alive and well. So what's going on that you need to call us here? Choji asked him with confusion. Not exactly. Neji says, as we all know, Sasuke Uchiha went rogue, and succeeded in his goal of going to Orochimaru. Kiba, Shikamaru, Choji, Naruto, myself, and Lee all tried to stop him and we all assumed that Naruto paid the price with his life in trying to bring the Uchiha back. Neji said before inhaling deeply and looking at each of them, however, evidence showed that Naruto may not have died that day and several forensics experts labeled him as missing in action while many assumed that he was killed in action. I am here to finally put all of it to rest. The Hyuga stated. Sakura says, so what, 
that pathetic loser failed in bringing my Sasuke kun back if he never returns, that is fine with me. Before anyone can remark, there is a thud, and next to Sakura's face is an axe. The axe missed her by a hair, cut some off as it flew by her. The hair slowly drifting to the ground before it embeds itself into the wooden wall nearby. Sakura shakingly turns her head to see the axe that could have killed her to see where it was stabbed into the fence with a scared gaze, as are a couple of the others from the weapon's sudden appearance, but Neji and are wondering where did the unknown axe come from, and finally, how the fuck did I even like you is something I am having a very tough time remembering said the voice behind the stone lion. Then the axe frees itself from the fence and flies through the air where the unknown person behind the lion catches it, flurries of frost and embers of flame and even a series of sparks wafting off the weapon's body as the owner's metallic hand grips it firmly. Turning to the sound of the voice, everyone but Neji moves into defensive stances as they hear footsteps hitting the ground softly but firmly. They pause as they see a man with a dark cloak and he has the head of a goat man attached to his belt strangely enough and for some reason, everyone but Neji is feeling their hearts beating, very fast, as this unknown man holds his axe up over his head. Gripping fists tightly, Lee says, hold it right there. Who are you? As he walks starts to walk over to him. However, a hand on his shoulder stops him and he looks to see that it was Neji who stops him. Neji what are you doing? Lee asks. Neji says, just trust me, you may want to see this, he nods to the man while the others are just as confused. The man gets into Sakura's face and she can feel the glare from under the cloak and the person is a fair bit taller than them. Sakura is shaking in fear as this man is just giving off as just an aura of a warrior who can and will kill them with no mercy. He places the axe in its holder and raises his right arm which, to everyone's surprise, is an obsidian colored metal with golden emblems and symbols carved into it as he reaches up which makes Sakura shake with fear and hoping the worst doesn't happen but it did. When she feels a tight hold on her face as the man says, that mouth and that belief of yours is going to get you killed one day. Do you think that that fucking bastard truly is innocent? I am going to say this, when I get a hold of him I will rip him in half for what he did, he bites out. Sakura glares at him and says, no you won't. Sasuke-kun is innocent, I will prove it, T then once it is all done we can get married and have a family together. You'll see, just you watch. And why exactly should I watch? The man says as he grabs the hood and rips the cloak off entirely causing all of the ninjas present to gasp in shock and wonder as they gaze upon a face they hadn't seen in over a decade glares down at the rose-haired woman, after all, he nearly killed me several times in our fight. He cut off my arm and ripped out my eye. Broke neck twice and more. I think I may just parade his cold corpse to the very edges of the world and let the people who suffered by his hand the justice of life. He tells her, the bifrost crystal eye blazing a bright gold, and you know what? I may just do it for the enjoyment of saying that I killed one of the last Uchiha in the world. Naruto told her darkly before he grinned down at her, Hello Sakura Haruno. Long time no see. It's been, what, twelve years since I last saw you? He tells her. Sakura felt her eyes widen as she thought that she was seeing a ghost, an unrested ghost as she says, and no, why you shouldn't be here, you should be dead. Well, too bad for you that I am. Alive and breathing healthily. No thanks in part to you and your machinations all them years ago. Naruto growls. He grabs her by the collar of her outfit and then slams her into the wall making a large hole in the wall. Know this I will bring the fucking traitor back, but not alive for your oh so precious delusions of a knight shining armor but in a fucking body bag, and he slams her into the wall once again. Sakura is no longer conscious with her eyes wide open while on the wall, then Naruto turns around and waves to them, terribly sorry about that, figured I let it out before we could have a proper talk, said Naruto and he notices all of them are in shock. Then Mimir says, I think you broke them, brother. Looking to the others, Neji checks them, yeah I think so too. Naruto then smirked evilly and pulled out a few things and got to work, he handed the burgers that Kiba had to Neji. Hold those as I am not messing with someone else's food. Bad for pranks. Neji nods and holds the bag. Neji says, a prank? Ain't we getting too old for that? As he holds the bags. Silence naysayer. Naruto yells as he points to the Hyuga, with white eyes and sharp teeth. Thou shalt bow before me for I am the king of pranks. Naruto called out loudly. He hadn't changed that much since they were still a bunch of kids. Mimir on the other hand pleaded loudly, would you please get me off of his hip, I'd rather not be part of this. Naruto says, quite you're as much part of this, remember they will be shocked by a talking head. Mimir sighs as Naruto carries on his prank, 
Yes, but please remember that is all I am, I don't want to end up like the frog. Mimir points out. Naruto chuckles and gets to work. Moments later Naruto smirks as he is sitting next to Neji who still has the food bag that Naruto handed to him before he started the prank as everyone is regaining their selves. Expect foe Sakura. Naruto actives the pranks for Kiba he gets hit by paintballs making him screaming in pain, for Shikamaru he has a seal of his mother nagging him. Choji's prank is a blindfold over his eyes that says everyone has gone vegan making him scream in panic, Tenten. Well she is without her weapons as they are traded with versions of them made up of paper. For Hinata, she is being buried by ice so she's rightfully pissed. Ino is now surrounded by fake dead flowers. Naruto laughs as Neji's sweat drops as this goes on for a bit until they remember that they had all seen Naruto and look back where he was but he's not there as from behind, are you perhaps, looking for me? He walks over to Kiba and places the bag of burgers in Kiba's hands but not before taking one for himself. Naruto then sits back down as Hinata was about to shout at Naruto he pulls a string and Mimir comes down by a rope. Everyone just looks at him and Mimir says, don't be alarmed, he's just an idiot. However, I would like to introduce myself. I'm the greatest ambassador to the gods, the giants, and all the creatures of the nine realms. I know every corner of these lands, every language is spoken, every war waged, every deal ever struck. They call me, Mimir. Smartest man alive, and I have the answer to your every question. So please ask to your heart's desire. Kiba raises his hand. Yes you, Mr. Dogman. You have something you would like to say? Mimir asks. I do if you'd like. Naruto states. Shut up. Mimir states. Your introduction needs an overhaul. I said shut up. Like seriously, that's the eighth time I've heard you say it. Shut. Up. It's starting to get old. Silence. Uh. Just just one thing. How the hell are you a talking head? The man panics. Did Naruto do this to you? Is that why he's here? To make us a cache of talking heads like you so he can take over the world and get his revenge on us. If so, I don't want to be a talking head that's constantly being taunted by his best friend. Kiba panics. What? No, his da did this and brought me back to alive when I was bound to a tree by Odin, said Mimir, then he looked at the others, anyone else? Shikamaru asks, yes, if you were so smart, why were you bound to a tree? Well, my former lord, Odin wanted to wipe off a clan of giants and I couldn't stand by, so I decided to help them the best that I could, and well, I was found out and was trapped in a tree as punishment," Mimir explained. Shikamaru nods, I can respect that. He lights a cigarette, a habit he got from his sensei. Kami, he wishes he didn't. I have a question. Mimir turns to Tenten, where the hell has Naruto been? Everyone looks at both the head and Naruto, more so with Hanada with her eyes sorely locked toward Naruto who is eating a burger. Naruto is not caring that Hanada is staring at him. What? He asks as he stops eating, is there something on my face? He asks. Well to your questions lass, we come back from the north, which is where I'm from, as it is a land full of green, gods of many kinds, people of several races in course, it's very cold too, it's quite nice, most of the time when you're not being attacked by draugers, trolls or dragons. Oh don't get me started on dragons, you know how many times I nearly got burned, Naruto complained. Naruto then goes back to eating the burger. Mimir says, so there you have it, he looks at everyone. Hanada then jumps at Naruto to attack him in anger and Naruto says, so the queen of the tundra makes her move, fine. Naruto dodges and he keeps dodging while Hanada is pissed. Everyone is about to step in to stop this but Neji stops them and says, no, this needs to happen. Naruto is easily dodging Hanada's jabs as she says, stop moving you bastard with veins appearing around her eyes. Naruto then grabs her face and with the momentum slams her into the ground head first cracking the ground he grabs her with his metal arm and has his left hold her arms upward as he doesn't say anything as he looks down and sees. Tears dripping down from Hanada as she says, why, didn't you just come home back then, more when we need you the most when I need you. Naruto says, 12 years Hanada I had no idea what was happening since I was far away. I know you had a crush on me a news flash, he thanks Itachi for that in his mind, I did not even know what love was. I was gone for 12 years and I am not the same boy you crushed on long ago. That, me, is dead and gone. You should move on. Hanada is teary eyed as Naruto lets her go and gets up and walks away, he says, well for what it's worth, I am sorry when I couldn't be with you guys when you needed me. 
Naruto then hears heavy footsteps and turns to see Tsunade and sees everyone and sets her eyes on Naruto. Who says? Oh um, hi grandma Tsunade, long time no see, he waves with a smirk. As Mimir can sense a massive fury from the Tsunade woman. Well, that's a feeling I know too well, a woman's scorn, he's a dead man, said Mimir as the background, wait why are you glowing like that? Ain't. You happy to see me? Wait lower that fist down and talk oh she. You blonde shithead, shouted Tsunade, boom, crash, pow, crash, what's going on out here, shouted Shizun who came out when she heard the breaking of stone then saw someone come out of the rubble and with a large bump on the head. You dented my arm, you old hag, the man shouted with his eyes big and white. Tsunade shouted in the same way, just be glad it's just a one hit on the head for what you put us through brat. As she held up her fist. Naruto disappears then reappears and slugs Tsunade's bottom jaw so hard that she is sent flying into the Hokage mountain hitting the spot next to her head. Mimir says, well would you look at that, that must be a new record lad. Eno's cry, of what? Drew all eyes to her. Mimir laughed, why throwing someone to the distance of course, said Mimir. All but a couple of them grew sweat drops while Hinata had gotten up and walked away. Neji holds a hand out to her, Lady Hinata but she doesn't stop as she keeps on walking while Naruto says, let her be, she just needs some time to herself. Then Naruto notices Ino and Tenten glaring at him. What? Naruto asks. Your eye, Ino gestures, your arm, Tenten says. And together they ask, what are they made out of? Naruto slowly backs off as he isn't sure what to answer. Why to ask the man who asked for it, when you ask the ones who made it, said a voice that Naruto and Mimir know very well. Brock, Sindri, Mimir and Naruto call out. Mimir was of course shocked and horrified as the blue dwarf had taken a large number of uncomfortable measurements and then left him at the Jochenheim gate for some time. Naruto was surprised and happy to see the ones who had restored his ability to see and use both arms. Well, who else can make a battle axe that can overpower a superweapon with the ability to destroy entire realms? Brock asked crudely. Don't forget. We need to make sure the little beasties didn't infest the eye we gave you, Sindri pointed out. Eno is in shock at the sight of the two as she says, W what are you two? The two dwarves look at the blonde, what are we? How rude, it's like she has never seen a dwarf before, said Sindri. Naruto says, that's because she never has, anyone here at the elemental countries as the northern called it here, the western land. Both brothers stare at Naruto then. I guess if you put it like that, shrugged Brock. Naruto nods, yes, here there are no dwarves or giants in these lands, explains Naruto. The two brothers turn to everyone as Sindri says, I guess an introduction is in order, he comes up first and says, well I'm Sindri, a blacksmith back in our homeland and now traveling one and this is, he has his hands over to Brock, is my brother Brock who is also a blacksmith from our homeland. Sorry if he comes off as rude or gross, most of our brethren are pretty much the same. Bah, just cause you don't like getting your hands dirty doesn't mean the rest of us don't. Well, I'm not the one who made an unbreakable chain using bird spit and a paw print. You made a ring out of elf ears and bee wings. Girls 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 you're both pretty now can you stop the bickering? Mimir called out. What did you say? Did you call me a girl? The Huldra brothers yelled out. Naruto is laughing like a loon as this at times is funny. Everyone else is just lost and Shikamaru says. I guess this is how people from upward there are like, he shrugs. Naruto stops and says, so why are you two here? Better yet, how did you find pathways that led here? The brothers look at each other, we had help, after all, we don't want some wannabe blacksmith touching the greatest weapon we ever made, said Brock. Naruto smirks as Sindri says, and of course, someone has to make sure that arm of yours is in working shape. Makes sense, reminds me, how are things back home? Brock shakes his head, not good. Ever since you killed the fat ass and his boys, Odin's had it out for you. Freya, your pa and brother are trying to see if they can find a way to help you. With that spell Odin cast on Balder Freya is trying to think of a way to break it so you can end however, a voice stops all that. There you are, finally, after countless nights of searching and digging, I found you, causing the three men to turn. Ah shit, this ain't good. Sindri curses as he gets behind Shikamaru as the man turns and says, hey. As he looks behind and sees that he's gone. Huh, this greatly confused Shikamaru, what the hell, where'd he go? 
Brock's gone too, Choji called, just up and vanished like the hiding camouflage jutsu was cast on him. Choji says in shock. Naruto looks ahead and sees a man walking towards the group, a wide smile on his face, with a growl Naruto says, Balder, we meet again. As he drops his axe, Thor's hammer, and unwraps the blades and drops them to the ground, shall we pick up where we left off last time pretty boy? He calls out. Balder laughs darkly, that's why I did this forsaken game of cat and mouse. Cause I want payback for what you did, not only to my brother, also beating me without finishing the job when you had the fucking chance. Now I'm here and I'm ready to beat your sorry ass, and then maybe drag you back home and hand whatever's left ya to deal with old daddy and your brother before I finish them off. And once that's done, I'll kill your whore as well. Speaking of said whore, how is my mother? Still trying to figure out my weakness. He questions with a chuckle. She's better off than you are now, Naruto responds as he starts walking forward toward the God of Light. Oh, and how's that? Balder questions as he strides towards the new god of thunder. She's still alive, and with that, Naruto leaps at Balder, his metallic fist being drawn back, ready to begin the next battle with his nemesis. Everyone is about to join him but they are stopped by Mimir, I wouldn't if I were you lots, this battle is far from your reach. When I say that two gods are about to battle, then I mean that two literal gods are about to battle. Baldur's been fighting and killing for centuries on his father's behalf, and Naruto slew his brother and nephews before he was cursed by Thor to be a god in his stead. You won't be able to scratch Baldur much less kill him. He was blessed with invulnerability to all threats be they physical or magical, and death can't hold him. And Naruto slew one of the most powerful of the Aesir gods and his sons with one arm and eye before he left to come here and find peace from the battle. Stand back, and watch the show. This is one fight you shall not interfere with. Enjoy the once in a lifetime spectacle of two immortals driven to kill each other. Everyone, doing the collective mind shudder info about this, there's a little pee coming out of me just now. Kiba whimpers. Tenten says, forget that. Look at those weapons that Naruto has. As she looks at them with sparkles and drools. Don't, you don't want to mess with them. Naruto's Da once used their chain blades to destroy an entire pantheon nearly 3,000 years ago before he managed to settle down in the Nordic lands. Went by the name Ghost of Sparta due to some of his more violent actions back in his youth. The hammer was Baldur's brother's hammer. That was used to wipe out an entire civilization of people for withholding their knowledge of prophecy from Odin and his greed to try and change his fate. As for the axe, that's Naruto's weapon. That axe is three times stronger and six times heavier than Mjolnir. Mjolnir was wielded by a true god of thunder, and his sons together barely had the strength to lift it when working together. You'll never be able to move them much less walk away unscathed. Mimir warns her. Tenten pouts as she wants to hold those damn weapons. As for Naruto and Balder, the two of them are locked in a battle to the death as their trade blow for blow, kick after kick, powerful shock waves blasting off their bodies as they clash again and again. I will enjoy slaughtering you. Balder wails out happily. Is this the same spiel as last time when I handed you your ass back on a silver platter, then get serious? Naruto yells as he smashes his fist into Balder's chin. Then why won't you do it? Show me why my brother granted you his immortality. Come and die by my hands like the coward you are. He declares as the two slide back after striking each other in the face hard enough to send them both reeling back from the blows they delivered. The two gods rush at each other and throw punches at the other's face. However, Naruto catches Balor's fist in a tight grip as Balder grabs his own. Drawing their heads back, they smash each other's foreheads into the other while glaring at each other. Even as they struggled against one another their clash caused the ground to collapse underfoot, creating a progressively larger and deeper fissure beneath them. Still, the two titans struggled against one another. Neither paid their bodies any heed. They fought on like gods of old, the earth sundering, world shaking, but Balder took the chance to tell Naruto his message, when Odin sent me here, I just needed answers, but you had to act all proud. Throw whatever you have at me, I'll keep coming, and that weak body will give out. But before I end this, I want you to know one thing. I can't feel any of this. As if to echo that cry, the world shook beneath them anew as the chasm continued to spread miles beyond their battle. The ninja stumbled and was forced to stick to the ground with chakra, what's going on? Shikamaru cried out. The lot of you getting out of here before we all meet our ends is what's going on, 
Mimir shouted. Do as the head says, get out of here, Tsunade says as she jumps away, her subordinates soon following her command. On the ground level, the villagers of Konoha are getting on with their business and life, that was until. Boom. A powerful shockwave could both be felt and heard from the top of the monument, followed by a gust of strong winds as men, women, and children scream as things are blown away. Trees. Rocks as large as a person. Windows to important businesses shattering under the effects of the incredible shockwaves. It was caused by two clashing warriors Balder and Naruto as they are going to end their grudge match in this fight. As both crashed landed on the grounds, causing the villagers to run off in terror with Naruto on top of Balder as he punched the guy in the face while Balder just laughed it off as he says, I feel nothing, in an amused tone. And then the god of light smashes a fist into Naruto's chin and sends him flying off him. Balder jumps after Naruto and grabs him by the face and slams into Naruto, the two gods ramming into the wall of the Hokage monument. Balder's fist is already drawn back and in the process of striking Naruto in the face, pushing the blonde up through the thick stone wall. Chunks of the earth fly through the air as Balder strikes him again and again before they run out of rock to smash through. Naruto flips back and rolls under Balder. Spinning around, Naruto grabs Balder and begins to rapidly spin around so fast that he seems to be a blur to the naked eye. Round and round he spins as if he were a discus thrower at a sporting event. Except Naruto wasn't holding a discus now was he? With inhuman strength, he's whipping around the god of light by his ankle. After 150 spins, he lets go of the enemy god's limb, flinging him off the mountain and into the village below. Balder crashes through dozens of shops. The cries of the villagers as Balder slams through their homes and businesses fill the air as a large cloud of dust and smoke fills the air. Naruto lands on the ground soon after and leaps forward towards where Balder stopped his flight. Grabbing a large cart, Naruto hurls it at the glowing god of light. Balder raises his hand and smashes through the wooden object, but Naruto was upon him this time. Balder spins around, grabbing the mortal and hurling the burly man away as he throws a wild punch at the blonde, their fists clashing in a powerful shockwave that sends several buildings crumbling apart to pieces to the ground before Naruto launches a powerful uppercut that rips Balder up off the ground, but Naruto grabs the god by his ankle and proceeds to smash him into the ground. Filling the air with a concussive blast of power, Balder spins around on his back and leaps at Naruto, the two gods plowing through the village square, tearing up cement and anything else unlucky enough to be caught in their path to pieces like confetti at a party celebration. Meanwhile with the others, Neji and others are watching this from afar. The earth shakes with each blow the two immortals trade one after the other, helpless to do nothing, all of them are shaking because they're angry that they couldn't help Naruto even though this fight is far above them, we can't just sit here doing nothing shouts Kiba. Tenten says, Kiba is right, we need to help Naruto. Mimir's laughter fills the air, you guys are hilarious, you want to get in the middle of a fight that you have no hope of being of any use in. This isn't a mortal fight that you can just jump in and pull them apart with a little bit of struggle, it's a fight between two gods, I've told you before haven't I? Balder can't be hurt or killed due to his father casting a forbidden spell to make him the most dangerous of the Acer gods of the Nordic. Immune to all threats physical or magical. Even death can't stop him. Naruto is only able to match him due to the fact he is a new god, blessed with the immortality of Thor himself as he died by the blade of Naruto's axe. Mimir told them. If this Balder is as you say he is, how can we make sure they don't tear our home apart more than they already have? Tsunade asks the head. I don't know. I may be the smartest man alive but Odin made sure to take precautions when he performed certain acts to where even I can't distinguish them. He put a spell on me since I knew Baldur's weakness and could expose him, but I can't draw on the memory of it," Mimir told her. You've seen it with your own eyes. You can't hurt me. Nothing can. This fight is pointless. Your struggle is pointless. It didn't have to be this way. I'd hope that you, of everyone I'd faced, would finally make me feel something, but you can't," Baldur declared to his opponent. Naruto took one last thundering step towards his opponent and stood face to face, now towering over his greatest enemy as of yet, that doesn't mean I must not try. Without trying, we never know what our limitations are in this life, he responded. Balder narrowed his eyes at his opponent as Naruto merely looked down into his eyes. Without ever uttering a word of acknowledgement, Naruto threw a powerful right hook that made Balder's head snap around with a thundering explosion of raw power. However, he rose back up and threw his right hook that smashed into Naruto's face causing it to turn. 
grinning. Naruto looked to Balder and cracked his neck, very nice, I should be entertained by you, let's get started for real. Naruto said as his energy began to pour out of his pores. As Naruto unleashed his magic power, Balder also began to release his reserves of magic power. The earth shook and rumbled as small rocks began to rise into the air. A bright blue aura eclipsed Balder's form while an alluring white surrounded Naruto. Shockingly enough the air surrounding the two proverbial gods, literally in this case, began to crack apart, the sheer amount of unquenchable raw power being released seemingly shattering the fabric of reality as if it were a piece of glass being put under pressure. And then, no words were spoken as the two undeniable monsters vanished from their spots and began to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. As Balder leapt up into the air, Naruto followed, but rather than throw a fist, Naruto performed a backflip and smashed his feet into Balder's chest forcing him to fly back due to the raw power used in the kick. Balder performed a backflip landed in a crouch and found himself sliding back a few feet, not bad, for a former human. He complimented the blonde, but it'll take a lot more than that to defeat me, he told Naruto. Naruto snorted, I'm more than well aware of that fact, Balder. Here the powerful god clenched his fist, I'll admit, you are a warrior unlike any other that has faced me. But tell me, how long can your body last with that curse coursing through your veins? He asked. Long enough to put you down for good. Now, are you gonna keep chatting or fight me like a man? Naruto asked. Balder raised a fist into the air and grinned, finally, a worthy opponent. Our battle shall be legendary. He yelled out as Naruto rushed forth to engage him. Balder dodged a punch aimed at his face and leaned out of the way of the next strike aimed at him. As Naruto threw another hit, Balder smashed his elbow into Naruto's face, only for the man to gasp as Naruto shoved his elbow into the man's gut. Spinning around, Naruto and Balder both launched their hands at the other, only for those hands to be blocked as well. Naruto leapt up into the air to perform a roundhouse kick, but the god of light caught Naruto's leg and spun him around. However, before Balder could throw him, Naruto spun around and smashed his other foot into Balder's face forcing him to let the man go early. Naruto flipped backward and kicked up a chunk of rock and grasped it, charging it with his magic, ha. Huh. Naruto grunted out as he threw it at the Aesir. Balder, seeing this, ducked underneath the rock and felt it skim across his body and as it passed by, the deranged god rose back up to engage his enemy, lightning coating his flesh as he did so, come on. He roared out. Leaping forth, Balder engaged Naruto this time, and his speed and reflexes had shot through the roof. Naruto leaned back and stood on his hands to use his legs to block Balder's flurry of rapid punches. Blocking another fist, Naruto drew back a leg and pushed himself up into the air while at the same time, he created a bubble of lighting around his foot, ha! Huh. Naruto roared as he smashed his foot into the ground causing the earth to rumble as he crashed down and smashed his fist forward, only for it to be blocked in return. Seeing this happen, Balder used both his hands to block a punch and then ducked under a spinning kick that Naruto tried to perform. Naruto was of course blocked, but it didn't stop him from fighting on. After the block, Naruto landed on his hands and began to launch a series of powerful kicks at Balder. Blocking the first kick aimed at him, Naruto then launched his other foot at his enemy as he twisted his hips in the opposing direction and simply grunted when he was blocked again, however as this happened he thrust his originally blocked foot into his enemy's chest and launched him back. Balder gave a yell and created a series of severing blades of light from his wrist, and began to slash at Naruto like a crazed lion. However, as Naruto leaned back to avoid one particular strike, he reached out and grabbed God's wrist, preventing the attack from hitting him. After Naruto caught his hand Balder then prepared to channel more energy into the energy blades and increase their length. Knew that Naruto wouldn't be able to avoid them, given how his hands were already busy. But before he could do this, Naruto struck first by delivering a sharp knee kick into Balder's cracked rib, which he cracked earlier in the fight and now broke. Once Naruto hit it, Balder cried out in pain and staggered back, nearly dropping, coughing up blood from the strike. Before he could recover Naruto followed up with a powerful kick to the chest, sending the evil god skidding back several meters away. Gwa! Damn you! Balder hissed angrily as he glared at the spiky-haired mortal before him. Hey! Don't get pissed at me! You should know better than anyone in this world, there is no such thing as a dirty fight! The smirking warrior replied before he raced toward the demon. For what seemed like a couple of minutes, which in reality was mere seconds, 
The two once again entered a battle for dominance and despite the injury, Balder was able to hold his own by focusing on the battle instead of the pain from the broken rib. When the dust settled from the intense fighting, the two enemies grinned at one another, as they had finally found somebody they could call a rival. Without even hesitating the two warriors threw earth-shaking left hooks that connected to the other's chin at the same second creating momentous shockwaves. Kaya, Tenten cried out in shock at the raw power the two gods were giving off as they collided. Stay behind me, Eno said as she used her chakra to create a barrier to protect them from the backlash of the two colliding warriors just as Naruto Spartan kicked Balder away. Balder appeared in front of Naruto and launched his fist into his chin while drawing the other back. Do you see now? This is my power. The power of the true immortal among the Acer, he exclaimed, the power that can topple even the giant race itself, he bellowed out, now feel the pain from not bowing to your better. Hee hee, Naruto grinned, you want more, well, have a taste of my power. Balder crowded out as he punched Naruto in the face forcing him to slide back. I'm quite surprised, to think you could make me of all people feel pain the way I am now, Naruto said as he leapt up into the air. As he came back down he smashed his fist into Baldur's skull, but it's only a puny sensation. Not but an itch, he bellowed out. The world around was filled with dust from the collision of power as Baldur's face met the ground for once as the two unparalleled warriors. Naruto stood tall and pointed down at Baldur, pathetic, I never felt any of those. No sensation or feeling within your punch, Naruto said pointedly. In the blink of an eye Baldur was up as he launched his left fist into Naruto's face, don't spew such nonsensical. He yelled out as he struck with his right fist, insults laced with pride, he declared. However, as if he hadn't even been phased by the powerful hits, Naruto smashed his face into Baldur's own causing Baldur to stumble back from the blow. As he recovered, Baldur smashed his fist upwards into Naruto's chin with great force. Recovering quickly, Naruto smashed his elbow into the immortal demon's face, his hand flat while his thumb was curled inward. The ninjas could only cover their faces as gale force winds pummeled their bodies. Tsunade, Ino, Neji, Lee, and everyone that was observing the fight could only marvel at the collision of godly power. Throwing out a powerful blow, Naruto easily dodged it and then weaved under another blow, but this was what Balder wanted as he grabbed Naruto by the neck and threw him away, where Naruto rolled across the ground before he got back to his feet. Rushing towards the unwavering mortal, Balder tried to land a blow on his enemy only to get a trifecta of blows to his skull that forced the immortal back further. The god of light growled in anger as he moved forward to try and hit Naruto, only for him to lean back and give him a right hook. Balder was stunned by the blow and is forced to step back as he tries to orient himself. Naruto gives another right hook to his jaw as he dodges yet another blow. Right cross, right cross, right cross, left cross and each blow drives Balder further back away from the village square and out of the village boundaries. Balder raised his arms to block the blows to his face, and this allowed Naruto to take a shot at his stomach forcing Balder to try and figure out just what was going on. For the first time as an immortal, he had met his match as he fought against an enemy who didn't know the meaning of, back down and he continued to get pummeled in the face. Growling, Balder grabbed Naruto and spun around, and smashed his fist down into Naruto's guarded face as he tried his hardest and gave his blows everything he had to try and knock down his greatest enemy to date. Balder growled as he tried to go for a left hook, only for Naruto to duck under and smash his fist into the man's gut, lifting him off his feet just as he had done to the blonde earlier. Going for a right hook, Naruto once more ducked under the blow and smashed his left fist into his enemy's gut, and watched as Balder had once more been lifted off his feet. Whatever either of the two had planned before had been discarded. Naruto missed a blow to Balder's skull and quickly raised his arms to protect his face only for the god of light to begin smashing his fists into Naruto's guts in earth-shaking blows. This could no longer be classified as a fistfight. This was for all intents and purposes, a brawl. As Balder drew his fist back again, Naruto smashed his fist into the man's jaw, a large amount of blood being spewed from Balder's jaw in a fountain of crimson, forcing his head to turn nearly 180 forcing the immortal Esir to withdraw. The god of light quickly recovered and threw a smashing fist at Naruto, but he ducked under the strike, just as Balder threw a powerful left hook that caused Naruto to spin around in a bit of a daze. However, Naruto quickly recovers and shakes his head, and glares at Balder, trying his damnedest to remain awake to keep up the fight. Just what was this guy made of? The two warriors, 
one, bloody and bruised, the other, with nearly no signs of injuries as they healed, strode towards one another once more. Play. Real Steel Ost. Final round, 250, for nearly three minutes the two traded earth-shattering blows, but it was soon apparent which was going to win. Baldur's blows suddenly began to grow weaker and weaker before suddenly, the Acer God of Light had to step back to get his breath. Just what was going on, he was the immortal god, the man who cannot be killed. Just how could he be exhausted? Neji smirked as he watched Naruto taunt Baldur by actually waving his arm towards himself to make the man try to fight some more. For the God of Light, it was an eye-opener, there was a fighter who was asking for more. Indulging the blonde, he began to hammer down blow after blow on Naruto's head as several ninjas cry out to him. Neji's voice called out to him, Naruto, you have to fight back, he shouted. Not yet Naruto, hang in there just a little while longer, Mimir murmured in prayer. He had been watching, stunned by the sheer audacity that he kept up with Baldur's nigh unlimited stamina with sheer guts of will and determination. Suddenly, Baldur began to land such weak blows on Naruto that they could barely be felt, Naruto smirked as everyone then heard Mimir shout, now. Before they saw the blonde land a devastating uppercut on Baldur's chin stunning both the god of light and the ninjas by the extremely powerful blow to the immortal man's jaw that sent him stumbling back in shock and horror. For the god of light, this was the first time in his entire existence that this had ever happened, he was being bested. This couldn't be happening. How? Just how was this happening? Striding forward uninhibited, Naruto landed blow after blow to the god's face pushing the stunned immortal backward. Tamari raised her clenched fist, get that little bitch and bust him open, she cheered out. Each step Naruto took, he landed a powerful left hook on Baldur's jaw forcing him back further as each blow landed unblocked and uninhibited. Changing his movements, Naruto began to smash his fist into the man's gut forcing him back further, and closer to his defeat. However, the God of Light knew that if he gave up now, it would be for nothing. Yeah, that's right. Lee cheered out. Get him Naruto, Eno cried out. I will not lose. Baldur declared as he landed blow after blow to Naruto's face as pushed him into the city limits again. As the immortal God tried to give another punch to Naruto's face, the blonde was swift and ducked under and leapt into the air, and smashed his fist into Baldur's face causing him to stumble back as blood sprayed through the air. Naruto grunted as he began to smash his fist repeatedly into the immortal Aesir's gut. After this, Naruto then smashed a powerful left hook followed by a quick right before, in a shocking display, the unkillable god desperately grabbed Naruto's shoulder and began to try and push him back. This was not only a shock for the group of ninjas watching but for all others as well. Baldur was trying desperately to stay up on his feet, but Naruto was relentless as he landed blow after blow to his body. Right blow to the stomach, left uppercut, right hook, left hook. It was endless, the blows unwavering in strength. The blows were not only undaunting but unstoppable as each blow shattered Baldur's bones again and again. The ninja all watched in silence, the world around them moving slowly as they gazed upon Naruto's visage, his body striking the sight of an undaunting warrior with no equal. They watched as he struck a powerful uppercut into Baldur's face, a proud grin etched into his features, and then he threw a powerful right hook that caused the God of Light to nearly falling onto his back. Naruto threw a left hook that caused Baldur's head to snap to the right and then he threw another one just as quickly. With the all-powerful God of Light reeling back, Naruto shot his fist deep into his gut causing the Acer to be lifted off the ground. Tamari was stunned beyond words could describe at the moment. She couldn't help it, this was something so beautiful she couldn't even describe it in words. And with that, a single tear began to run down her cheek as she watched Naruto fight like a god possessed by madness. Baldur was both unable to block or retaliate, as Naruto smashed hook after hook into his bruised face. Left hook, right hook, and then a huge uppercut was delivered, and for the first time in his existence, the god of light fell to the ground. Naruto panting as he says, You better stay down, you stinking bastard. He spits at him, with Tsunade who saw this thinks, I can't tell if his manners gotten worse or not. Naruto can't move his left arm that much due to it being dislocated which must have happened during the fight, damn it not again, said Naruto. Seeing this, Ino says, hold on let me, she stops as she sees as well others Naruto reconnected the joints, and it makes a very loud popping. The kind that makes everyone flinch as it seems like this is not anything new to him at all Naruto moves his left arm with no problems as he says, there we go, good as new, he looks at the others, what? 
I do this all the time, says Naruto without a care. You mean that wasn't the first? said the medic ninja. Naruto says, no it is not the first time at all. As this happened when his da taught him, some of them sigh with their smiles as they are happy to see that Naruto hasn't changed much. Naruto looks at his arm as it has been through a tough fight and then turns to Balder as he knows he will get back up again and he will be ready as someone from the back. So who is going to pay for all of this? Cause I don't think we have enough repair all of to fuck that guy is getting up. He's getting up, says a Junin. Naruto says, thank you Captain Obvious and for the damage. Don't you have invasion insurance? Before we run off, we do but he's not here to invade. He's here for you. And it can't cover this amount. If anything it is 200 times worse when the sound and Suna invaded, said Tsunade. Balder groans as his arm rise up and about to get himself up. He is as he is not from this land at all and he is invading the Shinto protected lands, said Naruto as it is true, well to him. The fuck are Shinto gods? Asked Kiba Mimir says, O oh Izanami the primordial Shinto goddess of death and ruler of Yomi, Izanagi the primordial Shinto of life and ruler of your heaven, Antaratsu the Shinto goddess of the sun and universe. You need to know them, I will tell you all. You mean our gods? Said Kiba. Naruto says, talk about it later cause here comes round two. Then he hears, sorry I'm late then. From a soft feminine voice where Naruto turns to see Freya as he shouts, Freya. How, when? He couldn't finish his words. Oh we can talk later, cause I finally know how to take away Baldur's invincibility, she holds up a plant. Naruto asks, is that mistletoe? Freya nods, yes, I was a fool not to think about it, given Odin decided to use a mix of my magic and his but at the base of it all it's still veneer magic, thus it has a weakness. Slippery one, but a weakness. Naruto looks at her then Balder then to Freya and says, then he could feel and that means he can die. Dot but are you sure? I mean the fucker is a monster but he's also. Freya nods, my son. Yes I know but I have to let him go, he's too far gone to redeem himself. Everyone heard as they looked at Balder then to Freya they thought, but she looks just as young, with their eyes widened. Naruto says, very well if it's your decision and I will go with it as well, so what needs to be done? It's not that hard, it just needs to be placed on him and the magic just fades away. But how long, I'm afraid I don't know, but I think it should give you enough time, to finish the job, Freya explains. Naruto takes it from her hands and quickly pulls out an arrowhead as just everyone hears, you blonde fucker. Don't think we are done, not by a long shot. Balder coughed uneasily as the remainder of his wounds healed themselves before everyone's eyes as he stood back up and glared at Naruto, so, care to try again? He asks, gesturing to his body. Naruto quickly takes the mistletoe from Freya just in time as Balder charges at him Balder tackles Naruto, the blonde stabbing the arrowhead of mistletoe into the man's arm, the spell instantly shattering the key ingredient to breaking Balder's gift of invulnerability. As both are taken the fight far away from the others as Tamari comes up to Freya as says, so what's between you and Naruto? I'm a teacher of his you could say. I taught him some of my gifts in magic while his father and brother went to spread his mother's ashes as she requested, she explained. Why do you look so young despite being the tattooed guy's mom? Choji asked her curiously. The gift of being a goddess. I married, well, was married, you could say to Baldur's father under the pretense of brokering peace between our people. However, this was all a lie as it was all a trick so Odin could learn the secrets of veneer magic and hold it over me. She said to him pleasantly, the air crackling with thunder caused her to turn around, we need to leave, Naruto's starting to get serious now. She told them, and I can't stop his power, he's three times stronger than Baldur but twice as strong as Baldur's brother who he slew in combat. With Baldur being unkillable until now, it gave him an incredible amount of stamina due to the spell cast on him, now he is back to his former strength, giving Naruto the edge he needs to defeat and kill him, she sighed a bit sadly. Baldur was her son, her boy so of course she was saddened, and Naruto was her friend, she was conflicted by the thoughts that plagued her being. So you're just a teacher to Naruto, that's all. Tamari asks as Freya nods, yes. Tamari hummed, I see, then Freya added, though there's one time I walk on Naruto as he was washing up at the waterfall, I will say, he's very big down there. Tamari blushes, what, as Freya keeps going, I believe it's this big, she uses her hands to show off how many inches which is about 9 inches. And very thick too, like thicker than an arm, 
Freya says. Tamari is blushing badly with steam coming out of her head. Freya giggles as she has a small blush. Naruto and Balder slide away from one another as they strike with enough force to shatter the ground under their feet. Balder laughs hysterically. So, the whore finally found the secret to the Allfather's spell, how amusing. Balder said pulling the arrowhead from his shoulder, the blood on it causing him to laugh, to think something so simple can undo one of the greatest masterpieces of Asgard, he stated. Throwing away the arrowhead, Balder looks at Naruto and nods his head, before we continue this, I want to thank you. You did the one thing that none of the gods of Asgard could do. Be grateful, this will be the final fight that only one of us gets to walk away from. Balder declared as he reached behind him, grabbing onto a large section of the wall that circled Konoha, a large piece of stone that was half the size of the Hokage Tower in size. Smashing the sides a bit, Naruto watched as Balder ripped it off its foundations and held it over his head with a grunt. All right, that's horseshit. Naruto states, pointing to Balder, you better not hit me with that rock, he yells as Balder slams the stone down on top of Naruto. Thunderclouds overhead quickly darkened as divine energy surged through the air. An explosion of stone blasted through the air as Naruto shot out from underneath the large rock Balder hit him with. Glaring, Naruto began to unleash his newfound powers of godhood. The air and dust around him began to whirl about and chunks of stone ripped off the ground and into the air as lightning blasted across the heavens. Suddenly, from the skies above, a gigantic funnel of air began to come crashing down to the ground. This was followed by two more large funnels that rivaled the first one in size, the tornado spiraling around the two gods as they stared one another down. The citizens fleeing desperately from the now more serious battle between the two gods as they glared at one another, unmoving in the tempest of the powerful superstorm. Within the funnels of wind, lightning flashed and burst like fireworks, explosions of light igniting the growing darkness. Large chunks of debris were pulled off the ground, quickly feeding into the storms surrounding the two men. Balder grinned in excitement as Naruto continued to glare at him, and without a word, the two gods charged at hypersonic speeds at one another. As they slammed into one another, the ground was ripped apart as they left the ground, a flash of lightning blasting through the spot they collided at. The storm's strength continued to grow, now filtering out into the gigantic forest that surrounded Konoha and even deeper into the village itself as the energy from Naruto's divine power fed it further. The two gods slammed into a large cliff of a lake that resided in Training Ground 45, chunks of stone filling the air as they crashed down, only to be ripped up by a part of the cyclone and hurled further into the forest. Grunting, the two gods landed next to each other and glared, but stopped when a shadow covered them. Looking in the direction of the shadow, they saw gigantic spires of earth falling toward them and quickly rolled out of the way to avoid being impaled by them. Naruto rose and jumped at Balder, a flash of lightning splitting the sky as he flew at the man and slammed into his belly and crushed him to the ground. Balder rolled over his back and onto his feet and grinned at Naruto. Thunder crashes once again as Naruto leaps forward, but Balder jumps left and grabs a tree, and spins around it before slamming his feet into Naruto's face and sending him flying back. The tree is of course uprooted, but Balder still made it work as he and Naruto vanished into one of the gigantic funnels of thunder and wind. Exiting the funnel, the two gods fly back to the cliff of the Hokage Monument. Snow filtering down as the thunderstorm calms itself and the weather trying to balance itself out, Naruto slams Balder into the stone. Chunks of rock flying through the air before Balder pushes him off and grabs him by his braid and slams him headfirst into the wall and drags him across the stone surface before Naruto grabs the arm and pulls. Balder has ripped off the wall of stone before being slammed into it a series of times where Naruto throws him to the ground, beaten and bloodied. Landing in front of him, Naruto draws a fist back along with Balder, but their fists only make a shockwave as Naruto slugs the god of light across the face as he blocks the hook. This stuns him which allows Naruto to wrap his arm around Balder's neck with him out of the wave of dizziness as he realizes that he's in a hold Naruto stares into the distance as he's ready to do what needs to be done with Balder trying to grab Naruto's face to get out of it but that doesn't happen, the cycle ends here. We will be the gods we choose to be. Who you are, is not who I will be. Snap. Naruto snaps Balder's neck by twisting his neck, where Naruto releases Balder from his grasp, allowing the lifeless body to fall onto the ground. Standing tall, covered in blood, and with countless bruises, Naruto stands victorious. Naruto says to himself, it's finally, over. I'm going to be so sore tomorrow, 
Naruto then walks over and picks up the head and asks, now what to do with this? He walks back to the others. Sometime later, nightfall, Naruto whines as he says, fuck that stings. Freya is treating him as she says, and whose fault is it? To fight another god without being fully adept with their power. She has a pair of tweezers with a cotton ball with a bit of rubbing alcohol against Naruto's bruises on his face since it's where he mostly got hit punched. Hey don't blame me, blame that idiot that came out of nowhere, said Naruto, as his weapons are hanging up as both, are in a tent given, there are no buildings left standing. Tsunade then walks in and is about to say something but Naruto says, don't talk to me as he was the one to invade the damn village so I am not the one you have to talk to, that'd be Mimir. Go talk to them with him if you have to. That man has a silver tongue at times. Freya says, right. She places the cotton ball on one of the bruises which he, ow. Why ain't you using magic to heal me? Well, thinking of this as punishment, not just for getting beat up, but also for leaving without saying anything, it made me worry to death, said Freya. Naruto says, fine also how is Hila? You mean your crazy girl? She's, all right in a way, says Freya. She is trapped in Helheim with only the dead and no one she can have a true conversation with. So I am not surprised that she is a little crazy, said Naruto. Well no, given that she is free and hellbent on finding you, Freya tells him. I am talking about before she was freed, Freya. Naruto said and Freya said, right. So what now? Naruto asks, we prepare, Freya said. Naruto takes the time to look at her, curiously by her words. War. The goddess said. Konoha, tense, nighttime. Naruto looks at Freya as he says, wait war? Freya, that's right, war, and given what Balder did by stepping in the lands that ain't his and the same goes for you. You may be from these lands, but with Thor gone and you having the title of Acer's god of thunder, you are basically an Acer god, well a rogue Acer as you are not under the Allfather's command but the gods here don't care, they will see this as an act of war between the two pantheons. Naruto stares at her noticing this and says, wait don't tell you didn't know about this when you left. Followed by smacking Naruto's shoulder blade, and Naruto groans as it is a sore spot, pain, pain, says Naruto. Tsunade who is still in the tent with them notices this as she thinks, something isn't right, he should be healing and be better now, as she sees none of the bruises and cuts ain't burning away like always did in the past. Tsunade adds her list of questions she will ask but for now. She will leave them be given that they had forgotten about her standing there. She steps out. Naruto asks, Now then, how did you get here on such short notice? Freya smiled at him, You can thank your two dwarf friends for that, given I was their second choice, as she remembers seeing the two appear at her place as well, hearing that Kratos refused to go, even if it's for Naruto. Naruto snorts, Of course, I guess it makes sense. Da not wanting to be involved with any more problems than he has. Atreus probably stayed behind to keep him company, Naruto said calmly, elsewhere in Konoha, so, what are we gonna do now, our homes are gone, our lives ruined because of that balder guy and more than likely his lackeys, Eno sighed out, she had her arms wrapped around her son and gently patted his back to keep him calm about the current situation, we can't vacate to one of the other villages, Iwa would kill all of us thinking we would be there to try and invade, Kuno would use us as breeders to make larger clans that would be loyal to their leaders and their leaders alone. Kiri is out cause there is a war between the bloodline users and the bloodline haters, we'd be killed not only because of our abilities but because we're associated with Konoha. Well Suna, we might get lucky, but they don't have the proper infrastructure to house the number of people that live in the leaf, and that is because it holds the largest population. We'd die before the year is out. Shikamaru sighed. Some of the minor villages could hold a series of numbers from our initial population, but they can only take so many. Our village alone has the combined number of six minor villages for just our civilian population, six, and the total for ninjas is triple that number, we'll bring the entire continent to ruin if we try to evenly spread, he slows as he notices a short person walking by while carrying rubble, dot r, people. He looks and asks, hey who are you? But the person in question just walks off ignoring him. That's when everyone notices them as well as more and more of them keep showing up. Shaking his head, Kiba says, who are these guys? And why do they look similar to these two? Oh that's because they're our people, the dwarves, said Sindri, who is next to Kiba as he eats an apple. Wait, I thought you guys are good at only smithing. 
said Tenton. Sindri laughs. Ha 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 ha. Us dwarves are good at anything that comes to making things. We can build anything from practically the most basic of things. I remember I once made a giant toad statue with little to nothing except a copper nail and a fish egg, he said nostalgically. That was strange. That, anyway, they're just rebuilding the whole village for compensation. We felt kinda bad for what Balder did, so we sent word to some of our friends and now here we are, said Sindir. Tenton asks, even your brother? Brock, no, he's in fact checking out your weaponry. I will be honest, they could use a bit more work, more so the ones of that shop we found. Sindir answers. Tenton says, my shop. I forgot about it. Oh so that was your workshop, yay it was banged up pretty bad. Shame, you had a lot of rare resources we can hardly find where we're from. They're probably common here, but sheesh, the amount of scap slag we found there was ridiculous. How do you come by that much of it so easily? Sindri asked curiously. Tenton drops to her knees as she says, T they were a rare collector's set, T they're worth so much Rio. Everyone said, oh, as they didn't like the sound of that. Well if it makes you feel any better, they're going to become a better weapon, said Sindri. The red-gloved dwarf stands there for a few seconds to see that Tenton isn't replying, I think. I think I should go, he just walks off. Um Tenton, are you okay? Lee asks as Tenton says, I put my life savings into that shop, as well the weapons and tools of God. She whined, but now it is all gone. She wailed out. Meanwhile, a woman, with white eyes and long dark hair a lot like Neji and Hinata, is sitting by a sizable fire with members of the same white eyes. This is Hanabi, clan leader of the clan and right now they are having talks about the events that transpire. Why? Well to find who to blame for what happened to the village. So has anyone any clues of what happened to cause all of this, said Hanabi as she meant the destruction. Only one seemed to have an answer, well from what I gather, they keep mentioning a fight between some gods, whatever that means, he shrugs. Another shrugs but agrees, yeah I heard it too, about a thin man that was covered in tattoos and another with a metal arm rather than flesh. Hanabi thinks and tries to get more thought into this and she asks, do we have a name? All of them shake their heads. Hanabi growls as she says, something is going on, but what? I see you lots are having a meeting as always, says the voice of Hanada as she stands behind Hanabi. Hanabi turns to see her big sister, Hanada, Hanada, what are you doing here? She demands. Figured with everything that's happened, I'd come to see if you are alright, after all, you're still my sister, said Hanada with her cold face, I live as well as everyone else, she added with a snort to their faces. Hanabi growls as she hates her sister, oh, so you care now. All it took was a mass destruction of the whole village. Then it hits her, you know who did this, don't you? Hanabi asked Hanada. For the first part if you treated me more like a sister and not like a fucking stepping stone then you would have known that I care about you. But you listen to our father and the elders. As for the second question why should I tell you? Hanada crosses her arms as Hanabi growls. As the clan leader I ord, Hanabi gets cut off, and in case you forget, I'm not the part of the clan, now then I should get going, as Hanada walks off as she gives a small wave, Hanabi roars in rage. While a few of the Hyuga children ask their mothers or fathers about who Hanada is and some say that was the once shy girl who won't hurt a fly and had become the woman the late Hiyashi Hyuga wanted her to be, cold. To be honest, a large portion missed the old Hanada who was kind and caring and wanted to unite their house with peace rather than through a law made by the daimyo. After Hanada changed then it really turned to hell for many of them as Hanada was now heartless. Later into the night, Naruto's tent. Naruto and Freya pretty much just only hear the hard work of the dwarves as Naruto asks, it is just the two of us now, is there anything you need of me? Freya says, well you're going to rest more, she is about to leave the tent and let him by for the night but she gets grabbed by Naruto and pulls in as he smirks, where do you think you're going? As Freya founds herself on top of Naruto with her breasts against Naruto's chest as she says, W wait, Naruto you should be resting. I'll be fine, I'll heal in time, he said, smiling at her. No you won't, the wounds Balder inflicted upon you need healing of the magical arts. Your people's healing arts can't heal these kinds of wounds. Until you can control your Vitakinesis properly, you'll remain similar to that of a mortal until your body physically heals itself. This is why only a god can hurt a god, 
and why only a god can only be killed by another god. Humans can't hope to hurt us, and this won't be any better if another of Odin's warriors come aft, she is silenced by a hand reaching up to caress her cheek. You talk too much, Naruto said as he kissed her deeply. Freya blushes as she pulls away a bit as she says, W we shouldn't and after why you and I have a, a teacher student, she gets kissed again by Naruto as he does not care at all. Pulling away, Naruto speaks in the veneer tongue, was Habik Geden, um dick zu verdinen. Causing Freya to gasp in shock by how fluent he was in the tongue. Freya couldn't contain her emotions, so she allowed them to take control over her actions, and she swiftly returned his affections. Two days later. Brock and Sindri watched with smirks on their faces along with several of their people as they watched Freya walk past them with a noticeable limp to her gate, well, it's about friggin time. You know how long I had to hear the two of ya going at it like a couple of Huldra in heat. He asked. Not to word it like my brother would, but yes. You two weren't exactly silent in your activities, the germophobic dwarf stated. Sorry, I guess we got carried away in the moment. Freya apologizes, a blush on her cheeks. Come on, don't just stand there, join us your majesty. We were just about to celebrate. The Allfather's been driven off our tails and the God of Light and God of Thunder no longer hunt their quarry. Brock called out as the dwarves cheered loudly. Really, that sounds like fun. Naruto said as he walked up to a fire and pulled off a leg of boar and bit into it with the raw ferocity only a Nord could well one raised as a Nord anyways. However, that was stopped when Naruto looked to the raised brow of Freya as she walked over and ripped the leg in two and quickly ate her portion and wiped her face with the back of her hand. Right you are, bring out the drums, bring out the flutes, the lutes, the panpipes, everything, this is the celebration of our friendship and growth as a people. Brock called out as the various dwarves cried out happily as they reached behind them or into various bags and pulled out dozens if not a couple of hundred instruments of the musical type, each was intricately carved and molded to the perfect shape and form to provide some of the most amazing sounds that could be created in all of the realms or pantheons. Well let the air of thunder and flame sing the first song, we'll set the tone, your majesty, just sing the notes. Trust me, we know your favorites. Sindri said smiling as he cracked his knuckles. Apparently the rowdy noises the dwarves were letting out were so loud, that they had managed to draw a crowd to see what the commotion was about. However, they got their answers when music began to fill the air and Freya felt her eyes widen in shock and joy as she started to clap to the sound of some of the panpipes playing and a couple of lyres and drums beating. Naruto started singing, a deep and high pitch to his voice as he sung, clapping his hands together to the music, grabbing an animal horn that was filled with a strange smelling alcohol, and as he finished his singing threw an arm into the air and downed the contents before throwing the horn away. Just like a true Nordic man would do while smiling happily. However, as Naruto finished his actions, Freya began to sing, grabbing the horn and dunking it into the large drum of mead that the dwarves had brought out to celebrate with, and then lifted the horn into the air, her arms soon covered in the sweet smell of wild berries and fermented booze before she turned to Naruto and started to sing her verse to one of her favorite songs when all races were usually seen together in peace and harmony. As she finished her verse, she too followed Naruto's example and downed her mead and then threw the horn away with a smile her chin and neck coated in the alcohol. Naruto grabbed Freya's hands and began to spin her around, his melodic voice filling the air as he grabbed his woman by her hips and made her grind against his groin earning a raised brow from her as she smacked his hands away showing she was playing hard to get at the moment. This caused several of the dwarves to laugh as Naruto played hurt by her actions, placing his prosthetic arm to his chest as if he'd been brokenhearted by her actions, though the smirk on his face said otherwise. Once again, Freya sang with a voice most of the observing celebrators would call the voice of an angel or in Freya's case a Valkyrie. She spun around on the balls of her feet, her braided hair flowing smoothly as she reached up and grabbed the sides of her head and swayed side to side to the music that she sang and danced to. And with a final spin, she grabbed Naruto by the chin and brought him down for a chaste kiss on the lips that had the blonde grinning. Then the two of them continued to sing their voices mixing in a harmonious melody as the pitch of the instruments changed and grew in tempo to the two gods singing and dancing in the ruins as several male and female dwarves with nothing stood up and joined the two in dancing to the Celtic song from Vanaheim, their arms coming together as they skipped in circles and kicked out their legs to the beat of the music filling the air. Stopping his dancing with Freya, Naruto spun her around and trapped her in an embrace where she was facing away from him, 
but her gaze was turned to him and he swayed from side to side with her. However, Freya was quick and spun out of his grip and turned to her lover and placed a finger to his chest as she prodded at the blonde's pectoral. ND as the dwarves finished their song, they all smiled warmly at one another, uncaring of the change in mood, pleased to see that the air was abuzz with gratitude and acceptance with what they had chosen to sing. When the tone of music died, the human children clapped happily as they danced between the small dwarves happily giggling causing several of the dwarves to laugh in enjoyment. Freya looks at Mimir, you seem pretty pleased with everything, she noted. Of course your majesty, I'd thought I'd never hear that song again. Can you imagine not hearing the greatest ballad that the dwarvish people ever made not getting played? That song's been sung by every dwarf of every age for every century since time memorial. It's their greatest pride, he said, shocked with joy. Brock laughed as he threw a lump of meat into the fire, well, we're pretty damn proud of it too. That song's not just our history, it's a literal way of speaking our souls into life, he said before he picked the head up, now, knowing you, you wanna sing something as well don't you? He asked the head. Of course I do, you think I wouldn't be singing these songs if I didn't have something in mind. Mimir asked the blue dwarf, causing Brock to laugh. I figured ya did, so, what were the tunes ya wanted to sing? He asked the goat horned man. Got must ein semen sign of course, Mimir said. You should count yourself lucky it's a Yodnar song or else you've learned to fly. Freya said, pointing to Mimir. I would never insult you in such a manner, my lady. Mimir said. HMPH, trust me, after that last stunt you pulled I'm having a hard time, but I'll allow it. Come on, let's have some fun. She called out as the dwarves grinned happily, drums of mead were refilled and horns of alcohol clashes and made large messes as they were thrown back and emptied of their contents. Play. Santiano, God must sign semen sign. Look around this world as ours. Let go of fear and worries here you are free, 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 free every journey is like a new day. Mamir's voice was rich and boisterous as he sang to a very cheerful and upbeat song, some of the dwarves seemingly jumping in at a short point, though Mimir seemed to appreciate the gesture as he grinned happily. Children danced and skipped as they tried to mimic a couple of the dancing dwarves as the music filled the area with cheer. Hold your hand in the cool waters and you will feel a power so great, here we are free, free, free free across the sky into infinity. Brock was beating a large drum as if he were hammering one of his great creations, Sindri blowing away into a set of panpipes, the whistling of the tunes filled the air as the dwarves raised their tempo together and grinned at one another, the two brothers coming to enjoy the moment. God must be a sailor. None is lost, none is lost. The devil never catches up with us. God has to be a sailor. Suddenly a large portion of the dwarves and Naruto himself sang deeply and proudly as a couple of the male dwarves wrapped their arms around one another's shoulders while raising horns of meat into the air and swayed heavily to and fro with the lyrics that sang with large grins on their face. God must be a sailor. None is lost, none is lost. The devil never catches up with us. God has to be a sailor. The dwarves began to sing louder, the festivities rising once again as Mimir sang to the heavens his eyes glowing with power as several images of Mimir being a goof filled the air causing several dwarves to trip over themselves as the children laughed and danced ludicrously to the lyrics as Naruto and Freya clapped their hands to the music while singing along, several ninja joining in on the dancing with their husbands, wives and children as they enjoyed themselves for once. Let us go with the first rays, let us go when the west wind roars then we are free, 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 free straight ahead into all the world. Dwarves spun around and danced by kicking their legs up into the air, several children and even adults joining in on the dwarvish dance. There was no disagreement, smiles were broad and growing, laughter filled the air as men and women spun about to the lyrics Mimir sung out. Where the waves reach for the sky in the distance we are at home because we are free, 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 free sky wide into infinity. Men grabbed their women and picked them up and spun them, dwarves dipped more meat out and chugged before going right back to the party not halting their enjoyment of the party they were throwing. God must be a sailor, none is lost, none is lost. He never leaves the crew alone. God has to be a sailor. Once again, the large mass sang the chorus with wide grins and spins as the people danced and frolicked about one another. Food passed around and mead was chugged faster than it could be replenished. Oh this was a good choice Mimir, God must be a sailor. None is lost, none is lost. The devil never catches up with us. 
God has to be a sailor. Naruto grabbed Freya by her hand and spun her around and pressed his face into the crook of her neck and kissed it before looking back up and swaying deeply as he sung loudly like most of the others with Freya laughing as he did so. Maybe it was all the mead. God must be a sailor, none is lost, none is lost. The tempo to the song slowed a bit, but the celebrations didn't halt as Mimir sang loudly and with pride in his voice. Naruto kissed Freya on her cheek as she placed a hand to his cheek and nodded her head in acceptance. God must be a sailor. None is lost, none is lost. He never leaves the crew alone. God has to be a sailor. But as soon as the tempo slowed, it picked right back up to previous speeds and seemed to actually grow louder. Children giggled as several of their parents grew too dizzy to stand from constantly spinning their wives around and fell to the ground before bursting into laughter themselves. God must be a sailor. None is lost, none is lost. He never leaves the crew alone. God has to be a sailor. As Mimir finished his song, several ninja cheered loudly and clapped as the dwarves continued to pour their mead down their throats before laughing loudly as a couple seemed to fall over drunk and being unable to stand. Freya laughed as Naruto pumped both his arms into the air, yay. He called out. Brock laughed as Sindri spat out some mead he'd swallowed, having drank too fast. The blonde god looked to the brothers, all right, my turn, he said. What do you have in mind turd? Brock called him, but Naruto took it in stride and laughed. Play along and you'll see. Naruto said before downing some mead. Play paid and perish, battle cries. We will march into the night. Let the fear sink in their eyes. We will roar our battle cries. The oath we shall carry strong. The mood didn't drop, but the looks on people changed from one of enjoyment and fulfillment to that of seriousness, a fire beginning to burn just under the surface. Rally up the swords and shields. Fight until the blood is fields. For the honor I decree. The heavens is on our side. Brock beat on his drums, several others drumming along as the Nordic song was unveiled to Naruto's listeners. The fire grew in their hearts and started to seep into their souls. We will march into the night. Let the fear sink in their eyes. We will roar our battle cries. Brock spoke up, his deep voice joining in on Naruto's song several people raising the horns of mead into the air, not spilling a drop as they toasted to his words before they swallowed the contents. The oath we shall carry strong. Rally up the swords and shields. Fight until the blood is fields. The look of determination grew in the large crowd's eyes, going from one to the next. It was an unwavering growth of understanding that this was a song meant to portray Naruto's will to fight for what he wanted and desired to protect. For the honor I decree, the heavens is on our side. We will march into the night. Let the fear sink in their eyes. Soon, Sindri sang along, his voice joining his brothers and Naruto's to create a trio of deep melodic voices that challenged someone to come face them. A loud bellow filled the air as one of the dwarves broke the end of a horn cup off and blew into it, filling the air with its call. We will roar our battle cries. The oath we shall carry strong. Rally up the swords and shields fight until the blood is fields. The unwavering conviction remained, engraved upon everyone from the eldest of the dwarves to the youngest mortal that had come into their celebrations. Looks of contempt were merely a whisper in the wind as looks of utter devotion stood firm. For the honor I decree, the heavens is on our side. Naruto finished his song by raising a horn filled with mead, the partiers following his movement and he then thrust it up once, spilling some of the contents in it before swallowing what remained. Brock clapped his hands together. Not bad ya little sack seed, but I don't think you can compare to my angelic voice. He boasted before spitting on the ground, but actually ended up spitting on Sindri's boots causing the dwarf in question to yell out in frustration. Naruto laughed along with Freya and Mimir. Okay, if that's what you think, then by all means, sing Brock. Freya said, causing several of the dwarves to cheer and beat their drums. They were excited and who wouldn't be? celebrations in their homeland lasted days at the minimum and a couple weeks to even several months at the most. Oh shut er traps so I can get the melody going. The blue dwarf cried out. Clearing his throat, the dwarf began to sing in a deep voice. Sailing across the mighty rivers row and row to the beat of drums. Heading amongst the raiding season. Time we approach the gates of foes. Naruto nodded his head and began to clap as a couple dwarves strummed their lyres and his brother blew into his panpipes, setting up a very rich melody. Ready and gather all our strength. The night has come of soaring rains. For the honor, have no fear. 
we shall withstand this night of war. Continuing his song, Brock jumped on his drum, waving a horn of meat around and thrust it ahead of him and threw the contents down his throat. By now several others had joined in on clapping to the beat as they started to smile at the dwarf's choice of music. Ready and gather all our strength. The night has come of soaring rains. For the honor, have no fear. We shall withstand this night of war. Brock jumped down and poked at Naruto before spinning around, grabbed a chunk of meat and ripped it off, biting into it and swallowing it without even attempting to chew his meal. Still, Naruto clapped with the others. Now drums beat along deeper with each pound, the lyre strummed erratically with each pluck as Brock kicked one leg out then the other in a strange dwarvish jig his people seemed to enjoy. And the whispers of our fate, and our honor be foretold. Brock sang richly, but not deeply like he initially had been. He held out his arms and slowly spun around as the music became a bit somber in tone, which was in contrast to the strength it initially displayed when Brock first started. Warriors of the Northern Lands. Madness forged into our hearts. Shields be shattered, arms of steel. Bloody axes fly with fury. Raging thunders shake the sky. The wrath of battle stains our minds. Rage of vengeful kings of war. Fearless sons and daughters fall. However, it seemed Brock had a fire lit under his ass as he began to sing in a deep baritone voice, roaring out his song to the heavens as he gained a look of determined look in his eyes which quickly spread through the crowd much like Naruto's song had done, keeping the fire burning inside them all the while longer. Sailing across the mighty rivers, row and row to the beat of drums. Heading amongst the raiding season time we approach the gates of foes. Brock spun around, kicking out his legs as dwarves pounded their drums louder. Clapping once again resumed as children and their parents joined in for the song. Ready and gather all our strength the night has come of soaring rains. For the honor, have no fear we shall withstand this night of war. Brock dunked his cup into the mead once again and toasted it to the crowd before guzzling the mead within along with several others. Several of the ninja had fallen over drunk, their bodies unused to the potency that the mead provided unlike the soft sake they usually drank. For the honor, have no fear we shall withstand this night of war. And the whispers of our fate and our honor be foretold. Brock clenched his fists and brought them to his chest, his eyes closed as he dug deep into his heart to sing the song to his observers. Several children swayed side to side with the music, clapping hands produced a nice melodic rhythm to the drums and lyres playing the music. Warriors of the Northern Lands. Madness forged into our hearts. Shields be shattered, arms of steel. Bloody axes fly with fury. Raging thunders shake the sky. The wrath of battle stains our minds. Rage of vengeful kings of war fearless sons and daughters fall. Brock finished the song with a bellow, the drums beating loudly as dozens clapped for his performance. Brock bowed several times before looking at Naruto, and that's how it's done rookie, try and keep up. He snickered. Well it certainly wasn't bad, but I have one song in mind that I think will make the coming morning a delight. Freya said before looking at Sindri, let's try singing Grati, she said smiling. Brock and Sindri gave a slight frown, as did Mimir, but, that's an Acer song, thought you hated the Acer? Brock stated as he pointed at her. I do, but their songs are quite entertaining to say the least, she admitted to them. Fine, we'll song er stupid Grati song, Brock called out. Freya smiled, I know, but what better way to celebrate a victory than to sing one of their songs? just to piss them off, she stated as she patted the dwarf on the head. I guess it's not wrong, said Brock smirking play, scald, grati. Awaken, if you want to listen to. Our chants and tales of yore. Suddenly drums were being beaten in a deep rhythm, lyrics were strummed at a high pace as Naruto and several of the male dwarves sung the first line before immediately grinding out the lyrics in the dwarven tongue as the song was meant to be properly sung. Sindri blew into his pipes, but every once in a while he stopped to bob along with the music. They sang and swung the spinning millstone. The ninja bobbed their heads to the rhythm and a couple clapped. They enjoyed this one, while dark, the melody was certainly appealing to their natures. On a ship, to giantesses Fenja and Menja, Mizzing asked to grind salt. He asked them to grind more. On a ship, to giantesses Fenja and Menja, he asked them to grind more, to grind salt. On a ship, to giantesses Fenja and Menja. Mizzing asked to grind salt. He asked them to grind more. On a ship, to giantesses Fenja and Menja. He asked them to grind more, to grind salt. However, 
Much to the ninja's shock, Freya's voice filled the air once again as she sung a beautiful song many would assume would be lost forever. Naruto clapping along as he watched the beautiful goddess stood and swayed to the beating of the drums and music produced by the lyres nearby. Awaken, if you want to listen to our chants and tales of yore. The goddess's eyes were closed, but the fulfillment of freedom was certainly sketchy as the woman spun and danced to the music. They sang and swung the spinning millstone. The beating of the drums was much louder, stronger, and more organized as the dwarves beat upon the drums as being prepared to start a war with someone. He asked them to grind more, to grind salt. He asked them to grind more, to grind salt. They kept on grinding a while, until the ships sank down below. Where the sea goes down into a maelstrom. That's why the sea became salty. He asked them to grind more, to grind salt. He asked them to grind more, to grind salt. They kept on grinding a while, until the ships sank down below. Where the sea goes down into a maelstrom. That's why the sea became salty. Freya's melodic voice sang loudly, in perfect beating posture to the song she had chosen to finish her celebrations with. Naruto sang deeply with the other men, several of the ninja's lives forever changed by the way the melody was sung, the instruments playing a serious but upbeat song of war and death. Awaken, if you want to listen to our chants and tales of yore. Brock and Sindri pointed at Naruto, the blonde slamming his palms together as he clapped while the drums were being beaten, they rang loudly enough for everyone to feel it in their feet, from the air itself vibrated from the music playing. The ground shook with each drum, each clap, the screeching of the panpipes resounded like thunder from various tones ringing out of their forms. That quern was named Grati. They sang and swung the spinning millstone. That's why the sea became salty. The mix of Freya's voice clashed with the drums and lyres but the song was unlike anything they had heard so unique was the music that the vision of this night would forever sear itself into their minds. Awaken, if you want to listen. Naruto bobbed his head along, but he sang the notes verbatim without missing a beat. And as the final lines were sung, Naruto gave a whistle as he grabbed Freya by her hips and lifted her up, and spun her a couple of times while smiling. It was a good way to celebrate. Even if it's just a bit. Until a day passed, at the newly rebuilt Hokage Tower, the office of Tsunade. I'm sure you know why I called you here Naruto, said Tsunade. The blonde man says as he moves his right hand as it has gotten a bit refined by the Dwarven brothers, well, I know it's not about my handsomely good looks, jokes aside, I'm aware you have questions, he looks at the older blonde woman. Good, now then, the first thing on my list of questions, Tsunade, with Naruto thinking, she going to ask first, oh where have you been? And all that, he hears, I couldn't help but notice that your bruises and other injuries aren't healing up at a fast rate as you have in the past, and given what you are and what you hold, so my question is. Tsunade has her hands together and places her elbows on the table and asks, Naruto, why isn't the nine-tail fox, the Kyubi, healing you? Naruto blinks and he laughs a bit as he says, yes about that, well, given it's been forever since I even heard the fox, I think, I think it's sleeping. Tsunade blinks as she looks at him with more questions, wait sleeping. The being made out of chakra with capabilities, known to wipe out mountains with a swing of one of its tails, is sleeping. Yeah, for twelve years and persistent, I suppose on that day, when I, died, I think the fox used up so extensively of its chakra, to maintain me alive but couldn't do anything about, he points out the eye, the shoulder as well chest which on the chest showing two arm size scars, I will be honest, if you had to see me, you would have had a heart attack. Tsunade nodded, I guess, so when do you think the nine tail will wake up? Or is the intention to wake up the more reasonable question? Don't know. Don't care since the fox and I ain't pals and I like the serenity that I have in my mind, said Naruto, so is that the only questions you have, or is there more? There are additionally, but some of them are explanations, I have already acquired from the others, so there are fewer, such as, what are you now? Naruto thinks about it, well I know I was born human but since fighting and ending the life of Thor, god of thunder, I'm pretty much a god now. I think I'm not really sure, Naruto answered. Tsunade laughs upon hearing that, not at Naruto, rather at fate itself, a god. That's something, if sensei saw you now, he would have flipped. Naruto nodded, oh yeah he will. So what are your plans, are you going to stay? Tsunade asks. Naruto looks at Tsunade when she asks him that, Naruto is about to answer her. 
The last two months were calm, peaceful, serene even. Currently, Naruto was sitting atop the Hokage Monument. He looked out over the near completely rebuilt village, now more than double its size thanks to the dwarfs expanding the borders of the village despite only half the space on the already rebuilt village from the Nine Tails attack nearly 30 years ago, the expansion was a welcome one. He scowled as he looked over the damaged sectors of the village, the place he had once called home, and he thought back to how Baldur had come and challenged him to battle. He was strong, but Naruto could attest that the God of Light wasn't near as powerful as his brother, the man who cursed him to live for eternity. Thor, if there was one thing Naruto knew, if one of the gods could find him, then who is to say others wouldn't come searching for him in this place? He knew he would need to inform Brock and his fellow dwarfs. Tsunade and the head ninja of the village, Freya was definitely coming her magic and abilities were unrivaled in any pantheon and only the eldest of the gods could hope to match her in wit manner and charm, he didn't like the idea. But he needed to move around to stay off of Odin and his ilk's radar, and sadly him killing Baldur, and having Freya revive his head which was currently gagged, was definitely not something that would keep him hidden, Baldur was like a beacon, his divine energy unique in the fact it could be sensed from miles away, and the same could be said for Thor before his death, and now his own. Baldur had granted him his own powers over the elements, as had Thor, but the difference between them was that Thor had literally shoved his own dying soul into Naruto's body, his life essence and everything forcing immortality upon him as he tried to reincarnate himself into the Jinchuriki, only to fail as the seal took the divine energy and quickly absorbed it and spread it across his body and erased Thor's conscience from existence. Footsteps from behind alerted him to someone coming, if you are here to kill me, get in line, apparently a major portion of the village wants to end me, he stated without moving. I mean, if that's what you want, I would oblige, but do you really want to die in such a lowly fashion for someone as yourself? An unknown man asked him. A god, Nordic, but not wanting to fight, intriguing. Tell me, Nordic god, who are you, and what do you want? Naruto questioned, unmoving. A chuckle sounded from behind him. I'm sure you already know, exactly, who I am child. But I'm still curious, how is it you managed to kill Baldur permanently, my eldest I can understand, his soul was absorbed by one just as strong as his own, but overpowered by a more ancient form of magic, but Bladder was special in that he couldn't die, the man said. He need only mention Thor and Baldur as his sons for Naruto to understand who he was dealing with, a god far stronger than both Thor and Baldur together could never best at the peak of their strength. Hell even with the help of Magni and Modi with them could they barely hope to defeat him, Tyr might have a chance as he was stronger than any other god out there, but he knew he wouldn't match against him. Odin, I must say, it's not a pleasure to meet you. Naruto said not turning, if you wish to avenge your sons, you won't get a better chance than now, I can smell the spear with you, he spoke calmly. Please, if I wished you dead, all I need to do is summon up the full power of the Bifrost to rip this realm apart. But, that is not why I'm here, is it? Odin said as he sat next to Naruto. The blonde turns to glance at Odin, seeing the mon's appearance briefly. Odin is portrayed as a slender elderly man of average height, he has pale skin, white gray hair and beard, his left eye is azure blue, he has an eye patch on his right due to his being sacrificed. He mainly wears an elegant outfit with a light blue shirt, brown pants and always carries a large brown jacket that he uses as a cape and usually wears a Nordic cold hat. Tell me, how is Godhood treating you, I would assume excellent seeing as your wounds have already recovered even with it only being a couple weeks since you killed my son, and set about the Fimble winter centuries before it was meant to happen, he said looking out over the village. It is a curse I would never wish upon my most hated enemies. It has perks, but the healing and strength are all I would truly take away from it. I do not see how you can happily walk around for eternity and act as if nothing were wrong, sure you have your allies and family but if they were not there, then the curse of eternity would be unlike any other. Now, I am doomed to watch those I care for wither and die before my eyes. I would wage a million wars against that fat oaf of a son of yours to take this eternal life from me, he spat. Odin sighed, you don't really want war, do you Naruto? He asked sardonically, all that blood on your hands, on your brother's hands. He asked him in a seemingly sarcastic manner. If you dare challenge me with war, I will respond in kind. I care not for the whims of gods. I respect them, but I care not for them. Naruto retorted. And yet, you yourself are a god, are you not? Odin asked him. 
I am an unwilling immortal, forced to take the burden of immortality against my will, and now that I have been given this curse, I will do everything to get rid of it. Naruto answered. Odin scoffed, what do you think you know of godhood? In your short lifetime as a god, has anyone ever worshipped you? Ever prayed to you? Can you even imagine that kind of love? No, you don't care, just like that selfish father of yours who took you in. You don't care about anything beyond yourself, beyond the monster who kills without cause. Odin called out loudly. I do care, I just don't care for the gods who take pleasure in making those of the earth have a hard life, taking everything they love and care for granted and treating everything like it is some form of game. Naruto said seriously. Odin stood up and turned about, I will give you this much, child of prophecy, you have a heart like your father does, but when you die, it will be by my hands, and your death will not be swift. For each time you are killed by means of which I choose, I will revive you, day and night, and you will beg for it to end, and when I feel satisfied, only then will I give you death, he snarled. Death can have me, Naruto stated darkly, finally looking to Odin, when it earns me. He finished, you have spoken your peace, now leave me. He ordered the old god. Well, I guess I can do that, but before I do, can I speak with you as a neutral party and not a potential enemy? Odin requested. Speak, I know you will regardless. Naruto said. Brother, don't listen to him, if he says the snow is white, he's lying. Mimir growled. I'll have words with you in a moment, Mimir. Odin said before clearing his throat, everyone's got me all wrong. You think war drives me, or power, wealth, nah, never have, know what drives me, what I really want, I want answers, same as you, see, mortals have it easy, when they push up against life's big questions, they can look to us to give them meaning, divine comfort, we both know that's a sham, but when we have questions, why are we here, to give meaning to mortals while living without it ourselves, no, we're more than that, he told Naruto, and what is that? Naruto questioned. Brother, don't listen to him, don't even bother speaking, he's bad news. Mimir said. Masters of our own fate. Me, the kings of the gods, you the child of prophecy meant to save or destroy all realms. I know who you are, and I just wish to help you define your own fate. He said offering a hand to Naruto, all you have to do is come to Asgard, I can help give you your answers, but you gotta be willing to help me with my own. He offered. I will sooner die than trust an Esir with my questions and knowledge. Naruto said, I will not go to Asgard, but I will not fight you or your ilk unless provoked into battle, he stated. Odin nodded, okay, if that's what you want, but know that my door will always be open to you. He offered, you need only call and I'll send Hugin or Munin to fetch you. He said before he stood up and walked away, and Mimir, I will return your head to its body and resurrect you to continue your punishment if you weren't already dead and attached to the boy's hip, be glad that this is the case and not the other way around, he said before he was swallowed by a cloud of ravens and vanished. Moments later, Freya appeared in the form of a falcon and transformed into her human self, her bow drawn and ready, where is he, where did he go? She asked. Calm yourself, he is long gone now, he told his lover. Please tell me he didn't strike a deal with you, that he didn't do anything that could come back to haunt us. She pleaded. Mimir sighed, he tried, but Naruto declined everything, including the offer of coming to Asgard, he told her. Don't, don't listen to anything Odin offers or requests, he will kill you if it means he can survive another day. I don't know what I'd do if you were killed. Believe me, I am not leaving for a long time, and as I told your former husband, death can have me, when it earns me, he told her, embracing the goddess gently. Soon, Freya led him to the small home that the dwarves had built for the blonde and the two spent the night making love to one another. The growth of her belly having gone unnoticed the last couple months. The next day, Naruto was angered as he looked to the wall where his weapons were. Freya could easily spot this and straddled him. What is it? What's the matter? She asked him. Someone has stolen the hammer. Whoever has it, didn't even need the gauntlets or the belt to do the deed, and they did it while we were asleep, he told her. Freya felt her heart come to a stop almost. Fear entered her eyes as she turned his gaze towards her, is this true, did someone really steal the hammer? She asked him in panic. It is not with the axe or blades on the wall, he said pointing to the hooks where he placed them last night when he went to go to sleep. Freya turned and felt herself pale, oh no, oh no no no. 
This isn't good. She said as she climbed from the bed and quickly dressed herself. Get up, we need to search for the hammer. We can't let another massacre occur in these lands. Whoever has the hammer could do damage even we cannot fix. She called out. However, before they could do anything other than dress themselves, a powerful magic filled the air around their house, strikes of lightning tearing into their home and ripping pieces of the wood apart. Naruto summoned his axe to his hand and quickly wrapped the chains for his blades to his hands, your bow. He called to her as he stomped towards the door and tore it open to reveal a large cloaked figure standing in the middle of his front yard, lightning striking around him. WHO are you? Naruto shouted. Rather than give a proper response, the figure grabbed an item from their hip, a bottle of alcohol, may I come in, I have sake, he told Naruto as he shook the bottle. You would not find me good company, Naruto called out. Oh, I'm sure we'll find lots to talk about, the cloaked man said calmly. Naruto turned to the shaking Freya as he noticed the hammer that had been stolen from his home the night prior. He pointed it out, and told her it'd be best to talk for if they stole a weapon of that much power without being found, they could do much worse. Freya nodded and entered the house as Naruto had told her to. Naruto reluctantly opened the front door as the man nodded to him and walked in, though he did stop to turn and look at the blonde for a moment before he entered the door. Naruto took a deep breath and wondered what new drama had come into his life. If there was a fight to be had, this mysterious stranger would lose this one. Naruto had opened the door as the god had walked inside and took a look at the expansive manse and all of its decorations. It looked homey and welcoming. It was something in his mind that Naruto did not deserve as he schooled his expressions and swallowed his anger. Nice place. He complimented Naruto's house the dwarves built for him. Naruto simply nodded as he pointed his axe at a table and an empty chair as the god took a seat before he shut the door behind him. The god then grabbed the hammer from his belt and placed it on the table, shaking the house as he did so, thanks for the gift, never received one so well made before. Excellent smithing practices never made one so refined and in tune with my abilities, the immortal smirked. Naruto mimicked the motions as he placed Jarnriper on the table gently, though the table did shake, it was never a gift, so I know not who handed my hammer to you, but I would be grateful for it to be returned. It does not belong to you, he told the man. The god could feel the heat radiating from the blade and noticed the strange markings all over the metal. He was sure it was the very same one who killed that fool Balder and his oaf of a brother, and its properties were similar in nature to his new hammer he had gotten a hold of. Those markings were something he did not recognize, old and ancient. Naruto himself was having strange thoughts about this stranger, and just how he was capable of lifting the mighty Mjolnir without the gauntlets he wore. He could sense his divinity but beyond that he knew nothing of the man except he was able to channel lightning similarly to Thor before he died. Though, he did wonder how it would compare against Jarnriper. A few seconds later, Freya nervously walked over with two cups which she placed on the table. The man nodded in thanks before pouring himself and Naruto a generous amount of sake as he held his cup and took a sip. The god then put the cup down and closed his eyes as he savored the taste, I have not had a real sip in years. It's amazing stuff. The man said silently to himself. Naruto had no time for games. Why are you here? He asked him. The figure inhaled deeply and sighed before he shrugged. Just, uh, being polite. He told Naruto. He then sat the cup down on the table, and pointed to the blonde. You seem like a calm and reasonable person. Are you, a calm and reasonable person? He asked him as he dipped his finger in the sake and rubbed them across Mjolnir, before laying his hand across the hammer's head. Naruto narrowed his eyes, if the moment calls for calm, he told the deity. The deity smiled and nodded, I'd say the moment calls for calm, yay, he told Naruto. Naruto raised his head up, who are you? He asked. I'm Suzano, the god of the sea, storms, fields, the harvest, marriage, love among other titles. And you are Naruto Uzumaki, the child of prophecy turned god of war, thunder, lightning, storms, strength, oak trees. Charged with the protection of mankind, and also hallowing and fertility. Quite the sum of domains you have, he said to Naruto. What do you want? Naruto asked. Suzano smiled. I came here to talk to you, to get the measure of you. I am not sure if I am impressed. Naruto snorted. I don't give a damn whether or not I impress you, he told Suzano. Suzano smiled again. 
Why, I believe that you should impress me. After all, I am trying to wonder why my sister gave up so much for you, what makes you so special when she had the fates craft your destiny among the heavens? Naruto stilled, no more games. Tell me, why the fuck are you here, really? Suzano, smile disappeared, I am a god, you half-breed mongrel. I live with the knowledge of who and what I am, but you don't even know what you are. If anyone needs to ask questions, it'd be you, he said seriously to the blonde. Before Naruto could question anything else, a knock sounded on his door as an immensely powerful presence entered the senses of the group of deities. Male, ancient, and extremely powerful. Naruto turned to Freya and slowly nodded his head to her. The goddess nervously walked to the door and opened it to reveal an old man standing in the door. He had his arms crossed over his chest and he seemed uncaring. The man appears as an old muscular white-haired man. His eyes are pure white and appears to stand well over seven feet when compared to the already especially tall Naruto who stands at six foot eight. He wears silken clothes consisting of white robes with armored pauldrons with a golden side guard, and golden arm guards. The man enters, seemingly gliding across the floor of his home. He looks directly at Naruto, you know who I am. He states silently, back before your alleged death and all this chaos came to these lands. There were some misunderstandings between you and your rival I would assume, he said earnestly, regrettable ones, he added as he grabbed a chair and walked over to the table, but I think we all have a better idea of who we're dealing with now, he nodded, now, onto the reason we are here, he said, we want no quarrel with you, god of thunder, but you need to fulfill your destiny here, and that means you cannot have such artifacts like my son's new hammer in these lands, it's not for the likes of mortals or mortals turned gods, the man said, so, it was you who stole Mjolnir while I slept, it shouldn't be possible for him to lift much less hold as it requires certain items to be wielded. Naruto said, narrowing his eyes, I will have my hammer back before this night is over, he said honestly. If you fight and kill gods who attack you, those not of this pantheon that is, then I can say it's self-defense. The old man nodded, but, you kill him, then that's not something we can take lightly, the old man said uneasily. When you have something that does not belong to you, it is stealing, you let me know if you would not fight and kill someone who stole your stuff if they came from a different pantheon. I would assume you'd kill them without hesitation. I am merely saying the same thing, but if he simply returns my hammer then we have no quarrel. Naruto told the old god. Can't do that, it belongs to Suzano, and Suzano works for me. I'm sure those friends of yours can make another if you want one. The god said, you follow me. He asked as he reached over and grabbed a cup of the sake and swallowed it all in one go. Lowering the cup he looked at Naruto, you have a debt. He said confusing both Naruto and Freya, he's no fun anymore, and I think it's time we introduce a little of my vision into this realm. He said motioning to Suzano as he said he wasn't fun any longer. What do you want? Naruto questioned. Well, for starters, I know that this lovely lady is Freya of the Veneer. We never had any problems with their kind as they were more along the lines of protectors than anything so she can stay. The head with you, I could care less, it's not a threat to us. The dwarves that came from the Norse lands, they can remain if they work for my kin and build us weapons of power. You can fulfill your destiny, save this realm, kill Sasuke Uchiha and all those whom actually are required to die, and you can remain here in peace, we will have no problems, it's that easy, he said. How does this peace term sound, for the newly named and esteemed god of thunder? How about we just don't kill each other? He asked as he stood up and walked around the table to stand beside Suzano, how about you stay here at home, kick up your feet, seek no quarrel with me and I'll have none with you. He offered, of course it means, that the dwarves will be under my command, their craft my own, and anything they make will be used to progress my rule as needed. And then that's it, then we're square. He told Naruto callously. Shit, I'll even sweeten the deal, I'll wed you to my daughter Amaterasu. I'll give you dominion of Suzano as he's been looking to change positions for some time now. You can even marry your sweet veneer goddess as well if it so pleases you and you can sire all the children you wish. This can help keep your village, your home, safe, he said motioning to the house, so that you can come back here and live in peace without any worries, he said. That's all you really want, isn't it? So, what do y'all say? He asked Naruto. Naruto knew his answer before he spoke it. 
He looked from the elder god to Susano and stood up. He took a small step towards the man with a narrowed gaze, no, he wouldn't allow the dwarves to be enslaved ever again. The elderly god sighed and walked over to Susano, don't take all day. He told the man as he walked past him and out the door where his presence vanished shortly after. Susano sighed as he raised a hand and placed it down on his leg in exasperation. He grunted as he stood up from his seat and strode away from the table and spoke in a grumble of annoyance, bout time. He stated as he snapped his fingers, summoning Mjolnir to his hand, a series of sparks escaping the hammer. Before he could react, Mjolnir was smashing into Naruto's chest, sending the blonde hurtling through the roof of his house and through the air above the village and out of the village boundaries before he could react. I've been waiting for this. You do not know godly customs, but in my realm, we have a tradition known as blood payments. It means I will take a piece of you for what you took from my family. You'll pick it up, Suzano growled in bloodlust, happy for the fight. Naruto tried to punch his face several times, and as he did so, Suzano continued to laugh. Moments later, they crashed into a large rock formation, the debris raining down around them as the crash threw more stone and into the ground. Snarling, Naruto continued to slam his fist into Suzano before they hit the actual ground and were forced away from one another. Rolling over with a laugh, Suzano got up. As he got up, Suzano snapped his fingers and called Mjolnir to his hand and held the glowing Mjolnir proudly as Naruto stood up and held his axe in hand, the blade glowing with golden fire. Without even having to gaze around he already knew where he was. Final valley, that was for Azanagi for declining his offer. Now, show me this so-called child of prophecy I have heard rumors about. Suzano snarled out, and with that, both gods charged one another with snarls befitting their domains. The two gods were pushed back from one another, the rage in their eyes very visible as they gazed at one another, is this the one who will make or destroy my pantheon, how pathetic. Suzano growled. I will tell you as I did Odin, I care not for the whims of the gods, all they do is cause the mortals to suffer on account of their greed. Suzano scoffed. I don't care. The god claimed as he grabbed the axe as Naruto swung it down and then slammed Mjolnir into his face where Naruto was sent flying. Suzano twirled the hammer around as he dashed forward with the power of wind behind him. Naruto's eyes bulged as he was immediately on the defensive. Slamming into a large stone and shattering it, Naruto grunted as he glared at Suzano, striking at him like a cobra and delivering swift, sharp, precise strikes with such venom as all Naruto could do was block, parry, and stay on the defensive. A blast of energy shooting out as Naruto called upon his shield. However, before Suzano could retaliate, Naruto shot his foot out and caught him with a kick that sent the Shinto God of Thunder reeling back with a grunt. What's the matter? Can't fight without your axe. Coward. Suzano snarled. Naruto ignored the taunts as he kept his guard up. Suzano, blows became heavier and faster as he could see fire in his eyes. How are you a god of war? You insult me by holding back like this. He snarled before he clapped his hands together unleashing a blast of energy and lightning that sent Naruto reeling back. It wasn't that he didn't dodge, it was just Suzano acted quickly before he could mount a defense. Suzano launched his hammer at Naruto as he parried it. And then, the same hammer materialized in his hands as he fired more hammers at his. Naruto then rushed forward as Suzano snapped his fingers. The hammers struck with powerful blasts of lightning as Naruto was pushed back violently into the ground as he groaned. Suzano walked up to him, lifted him up, and headbutted him violently as he lifted him with one hand, you insult the memory of Thor by holding back like this. I expected more from you. You spit on his memories. The god growled as Naruto once more hit the ground. Naruto returned Suzano, headbutt as he was on the ground, pushing the god back. The blonde rushed forward and began violently punching and kicking him, as Suzano intercepted his fist. Naruto manifested his shield from his wrist gauntlet as he pushed Suzano back into a stone wall. You seem to know much about me, Suzano. The child of prophecy thing. Yeah. The storm god grunted. Then you should know what I am capable of. Why don't you show me? Suzano roared. Suzano pushed Naruto back as Naruto raised his hand and Jarngriper returned to his hand as Suzano rushed forward. Naruto brought his blade low as to his shock, it was shoved deep into flesh, stuck in his abdomen. He pulled the blade back quickly as he saw Suzano smile and touch his wound. He looked at his blood and smiled with glee. Naruto looked at him with confusion. However that confusion soon turned to glee, 
Now, we got ourselves a fight. He said happily as he launched forward and jumped up, and slammed a fist into the ground that sent Naruto flying away where he crashed into a large rock that crumbled under his flesh. Suzano gave a deep growl, was hoping to see your blades, but it seems they aren't worth the time are they? He questioned. Suzano rushed forward like a cobra and caught Naruto unaware with powerful, sharp strikes to his face and abdomen as he was launched into the dirt. Suzano was quick as he also gripped Naruto by the throat and lifted him back up and slammed him back into the dirt. Naruto slammed Jarngriper into the dirt as fire began to engulf the ground. Jarngriper glowed as did Naruto's eyes. He screamed as he was consumed by a fiery rage and sheer blood lust. His hands were on fire as Suzano now looked on with interest. With a roar, Naruto got up and rushed forward with fire covering his fists, unleashing a barrage of powerful punches into Suzano's face, sending the god sliding back, leaping up, he smashed both fists down, unleashing a linear shockwave that sent Suzano crashing back. Stomping on the ground, Naruto ripped up a large rock and sent it flying at his enemy where it smashed into him, and caused him to fall back into a wall. Suzano smirked. What is this? He asked gleefully. Now we're talking. He crowed out gladly. Now we got ourselves a real fight. He declared. Naruto rushed forward and began hitting Suzano with violent blows. There was all manner of punches and kicks as he was unleashing his rage. Suzano could not react properly as Naruto brought his hands violently down on his back. Suzano coughed out a glob of blood, as he snapped his fingers and smacked him away with Mjolnir. The battlefield was now covered in small flames. Naruto kicked Suzano by the foot and raised him overhead and slammed him into the ground and jumped up, slamming his fists into the ground as Suzano rolled out of the way. Though he avoided the blow, he hadn't escaped the shockwave and was sent flying through the rubble as the fire calmed itself and the rage vanished, was that all? I thought you were finally showing me something. Suzano demanded in frustration. Let me see the monster inside, he demanded angrily. In a bolt of frozen fury, Naruto rejoined the fray, swinging his axe down at the storm god's side in a horizontal slash to bite deeply into his right side. A wet cough answered him as Suzano pulled himself off the frozen metal, only to find himself launched bodily into the air by the follow-up attack in the form of a vicious uppercut. An overhead slam from Naruto continued the combo and slammed Suzano into the earth, to which Naruto then followed as he whirled around and repeated the same swing, this time in the opposite direction. Vicious alternating strikes descended on him from every angle, left, right, horizontal, vertical and beyond. A storm of blows no man no god could ever hope to escape from, and throughout, he made only the most meager of efforts to defend himself. Rather, he seemed to prioritize offense over defense, hammer-like fists metal shield and flesh alike, sparing no discrimination for either. Growling as Suzano summoned Mjolnir again, Naruto roared and both weapons clashed. Suzano kicked him in the face as he twirled Mjolnir around, creating a vortex of lightning that he launched at Naruto. Naruto growled as energy surrounded Jarngriper in fire and he bisected the vortex of electricity, only for Suzano to land in front of him and uppercut him into the air before bringing the hilt of his hammer on his face. Naruto groaned as he landed into the dirt, while Suzano taunted him, You are fucking hopeless. How were you ever capable of killing the Norse god of thunder? I killed the former god of thunder like this. Naruto snarled as he dashed forward and slashed at Suzano, unleashing unforgiving blows that Suzano could barely dodge. He managed to land gruesome hits as Suzano laughed. He roared as Suzano smacked him in the air with Mjolnir as his ability of aerokinesis gave him the ability to fly. Moments later, Naruto crashed into a wall, as he barely dodged the hammer, that was for Thor. He roared. Naruto slammed the blade of Jarngriper into Suzano's stomach as suddenly they were in the air once again, whirling around one another again. Slamming into the earth, Suzano snarled as he pushed Naruto's head violently into the ground and pulled Jarngriper from his side as he admired the night sky as he stood up and threw the axe to the ground, so weak, and pathetic, he said in disappointment. Naruto grabbed a broken stone column and slammed it into Suzano where the bloodthirsty god stumbled forward. This however made Suzano laugh, I guess if you're not fighting dirty, you are not fighting hard at all. I did not want this, you struck first, Naruto roared out. Of course, that's because I wanted this. That's good. That's what makes might right, Suzano growled out. The two of them circled one another as their weapons clashed. 
Naruto was drawing blood as Suzano did as the two of them were now lost in their lust for the fight. Naruto's blood boiled and burned as Jarngraper glowed. And the same happened with Suzano as Mjolnir glowed with energy. I did nothing to you. I am not responsible for what happens during this fight, but at the same time I wish for no quarrel between either of us. This is because of your father. Your father is scum. Naruto bellowed. Do you think I give a shit? I want my dues in blood. Declared Suzano as he grabbed Naruto in a bear hug and slammed him into the dirt as he was kicked across the face into a stone column. Was it luck? Suzano demanded as Naruto kicked him and pushed him away, only for Suzano to grab him and slam him into the ground. Was it blind fucking luck? Did my rival die to sheer fucking luck? He demanded. Naruto growled as Jarngraper and Mjolnir clashed again. This time, Suzano was pushed back violently as Naruto grabbed a stone pillar and smacked Suzano across the face with it, his blood boiling as he could feel himself growing stronger and stronger. Suzano simply smiled as he grabbed Naruto and threw him into a wall. Naruto blocked the hammer as he rushed forward when it suddenly smacked Naruto from behind, sending him to the dirt, dumbass. Suzano growled, get up. Another sparking hammer blow rocked his world, turning everything red. I'm not leaving until I see the real you, his head snapped back, spitting blood. What's wrong? Still the onslaught continued. You think you can leave and become a god, and then come back to this land, get a fancy axe and hammer, and fulfill some bullshit destiny, latch onto a family, get a clean slate. A tooth whistled free as he decked him across the face. That ain't how it works. We both know you're not some weakling. You're better than that. A kick launched him away only for a hand to catch his ankle and sent him slamming down. I know it, I can see it in your eyes. The hammer hurtled after him, flung with intent to bash his skull in. You, Rhea Destroyer, like me. A clawed hand caught the hammer. Red eyes narrowed, quote dot dot dot, I know. The hammer was heavy, terribly so, yet here in this instant, he could hold it back. He'd always known, hadn't he? His foe only laughed and recalled the hammer back into his waiting hand. There he is. Now fight like you mean it. Scarlet light swelled around him. I'll kill you. With an attitude like that, you just might. Naruto's blood boiled at the insult. He growled as he struggled to hold back Mjolnir, only for Suzano to slam the hammer into Naruto's face, nearly killing the blonde with the blow as his skull cracked open and blood flowed freely. As he felt his life fading away, he heard Suzano laugh. Oh no you don't. He heard, I say when we're finished. He stated before Naruto gasped in agony as raw life energy flowed from Suzano through the hammer followed by agonizing jolt of electricity. Naruto rolled over as he shook from the lightning, I'm not leaving until I see the real you, the man who killed Thor, now get up. He commanded. Suzano then threw Naruto hard into the ground as Suzano summoned Mjolnir, stop holding back. Suzano roared. There's no way that Thor could have died to someone like this. Show me who you really are. He commanded. Naruto snarled as he hurled Jarngriper, only for Suzano to dodge out of the way. Suzano snapped his fingers and called Mjolnir, this is the son of the god that murdered a pantheon cause they hurt his feelings. He demanded only for Naruto to hurl Jarngriper once more where the handle slammed home into Suzano's face stunning him where Naruto ran forward and grabbed him by the throat. However, Suzano recovered quickly and tried to grab Naruto, only for Naruto to slam his fist into the storm god's jaw which made him stumble back. Naruto punched Suzano as hard as he could and then kept on punching him, as he spit out blood. Suzano pulled him into a bear hug and launched him into the air as he kept on punching him. As they fell, Suzano grabbed Naruto's hand and hurled him down into the ground. Rolling to his feet, as he called upon his shield and slid back on it. Naruto looked at Suzano as the enemy deity snarled back. Suzano narrowed his eyes as golden energy swirled around Mjolnir, and it was being compressed and compressed. Naruto's eyes widened as he clasped his hand around Jarngriper and the axe swiftly returned to his hands. He held it with both hands as he closed his eyes and energy swirled around it. He opened his eyes as Suzano roared, and this is for Amaterasu. Jarngriper and Mjolnir were thrown at each other as they were locked in a stalemate. Energy began leaking into the battlefield as the ground began to quake violently. The two circled one another as Naruto responded, I had nothing to do with this. Thor challenged me, I am responsible for his death, yes, but not for his stupidity in fighting me. You should be mad at Azanagi, 
he's the one who made us do this. Oh wow, we got a paragon of wisdom here, Suzano said sarcastically. Both called back their weapons as they clashed. Naruto coated Jarngraper in ice, trying to overpower Mjolnir's lightning, but the resulting clash unleashed a pillar of energy as they both were pushed back violently into the dirt. A bolt of lightning fell from the heavens and froze immediately as the two forces of energy crashed into one another. The two gods rose up and looked at the phenomena in curiosity. Hum, this seems familiar. What? It does not matter. I don't care about your advice. I want to see the god of war. The god of thunder who usurped the former. Suzano rushed forward, launching a series of fast blows as he pushed Naruto back. You started this, I will end it. Naruto snarled back. Suzano slammed Mjolnir into Naruto's jaw, sending him flying back in a daze where he dropped Jarngraper in mid-flight. Suzano chuckled in dark humor as he picked up the blade and then screamed in pain as he dropped it instantly. He was on his knees as he panted. His hand was cut and started to look a little charred as Jarngraper rejected him. Naruto raised his hand as the axe returned to his and Suzano stared at his with nothing but venom. This blade can only be used by the one it acknowledges as its master. Every weapon has a soul, Suzano. It's the same with Mjolnir. I can never wield that weapon as it answers to Thor, but I killed him in combat so it has no true master. Let us stop this Suzano. You can never win this fight. I don't need a fancy axe to kill you, bastard. I am done playing around. Your life is now mine. Naruto hurled Jarngraper at the cliff, a chunk of stone falling down but missing its target, clever, but clever won't beat me, Suzano called back. Suzano eyes glowed as immense magical energy surrounded Mjolnir, with the energy arcing around him as it compressed and compressed. Naruto closed his eyes and concentrated the magical energy in Jarngraper and compressed it, forming it along the length of the axe head. Both opened their eyes as Suzano roared, now die. Two immensely powerful energy beams had collided violently against one another as the battlefield turned to smoke and ash and death. Flames covered the field as both combatants were pushed back violently. And when the smoke cleared, Suzano appeared in front of the blonde, Mjolnir raised high before he brought it down in a flurry of blows that shredded his shield to pieces before he stopped and grabbed his throat. I see why Thor lost, even to this lesser version of you. But I am not Thor. I don't care about you. And your, lover, I have plans for her he bit out. And when he said those words, Naruto had lost it. He did not care if he hurt a god no matter the pantheon badly now. He violently head-butted Suzano and then punched him violently across the face as Naruto yelled, letting out his frustrations and pain as his blood boiled. Suzano simply stumbled back before he smiled and chuckled as he coughed up some blood before he reached into his mouth and removed a tooth, there he is, there's the god of war. Suzano chuckled. Naruto was ready for another fight and then Suzano spoke again, consider your blood debt paid. For you it might be, but I still have things I wish to settle, Naruto declared. Suzano shrugged, very well then, as you wish. He said before he dropped the hammer, I don't see what's so special about a block of metal anyways. He grumbled before he leapt away in a spark of lightning, Mjolnir embedded into the stone. Naruto grunted as he held his hand up calling out to Mjolnir where it flew into his hand with a crackle of electricity and then called upon Jarngriper and replaced both hammer and axe on his hips. He then turned his gaze to the destruction. He could sense the lingering energy in several areas, but here, the damage was too great to ignore. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.